So um, we're going to start. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, and good evening, uh, whatever the place that you are in now. I know that we are having uh, a lot of uh, uh, attendees from different countries. So I hope all of you enjoy the uh, Lincolnshire ENT radiology course, which is a hybrid course. We have uh, some people on the ground today and others um, uh, watching us through the uh, the webinar. Uh, it uh, at the um, accredited or awarded five CBT point from the Royal College of Edinburgh as well. Uh, we having uh, in the uh, after the course, we will have hands on ultrasound um on the ground so we have uh, uh some of the um the attendees will be uh, also on site so we are in uh, lincolnshire so who doesn't know where is lincolnshire it's a part of the uh, uk that's um at the almost midlands or west uh west uh, east midlands sorry uh, it's a nice uh, historical um, city um, based on the Romanian uh, or Roman um, based uh, city, which is called London. Um, I don't know much about the history, but I would say it's an amazing uh, site as well to see. Uh, we are United Lincolnshire Hospital, so we are like a six uh, hospital um, joining together in one trust. The largest one is the Lincoln County Hospital, which we are based here today. And I would like to thank all, all of my colleagues that uh, who are um, uh, helping today uh, with us. The invited faculty started from Professor Alam, Professor Alkmer, um, Professor Sohota, uh, Professor uh, Pasha, and uh, Mr. Um, Alfiki. Also, my local faculty, uh, they just joined now late, uh, but they are around as well. So thank you for everyone. Shortly, this is the um, the program. We should start uh, one thirty, but unfortunately, we start a little bit late. But hopefully, this uh, will. You are muted again, right? You are muted, Doctor. You are muted, Doctor Ibrahim. Is is. Everyone here can hear me now, yeah? Sorry for this. Uh, yeah. Have you muted uh, the attendees? Yeah, yeah, but you admit them. Thank you. So, uh, sorry for this. Back again to the presentation. Um, So um, as I said, uh, the uh, we have uh, around 500 attendees from different places and different countries. Uh, we have around uh, 170 from the UK uh, and other countries. Uh, thank you for all of the attendees um, and to make effort as well because of the difference of time in, uh, between the countries. Um, this is uh, something personal, but I would like to thanks. Uh, the people who contribute in uh, my career at the teach me the CT scan, uh, Professor Hassan Wahba, bless him, um, God bless his soul. He he died uh, recently, uh, and the uh, my uh, senior professor uh, Muhammad uh, Al Bigami, both of them from Encham University, uh, and would like also to thank the, the people who also helped me, my mentors that who passed in the the COVID uh, time. Uh, Professor Wafai Abdurasul, 
Professor Said Siam and Professor Amr Badri. Um, thank you. We're going to start uh, our uh, next lecture now. Adil, can you just confirm? Hello? Yes. I can indeed. Yes. Okay. So, um, thank you. So, the first um, um, topics will be the CT Timber Bone. We're going to go through the basic bits of it. Um, just um, this is again the Lincoln uh, and the amazing uh, scene of it. So, we invited everyone to come to, uh, to support Lincoln um, tourist uh, sites. Uh, so the topics today is the uh, we're gonna go through the uh, introduction about the CT timber bone. Um, okay, so uh, so and then we're gonna go through the Petrus uh, uh, Petrus bone axial cuts and the coronal cuts, uh, followed by the fission uh, anatomy. So it's mainly about the anatomy. So. Basically, the what we need for a CT scan, we need the high resolution CT scan. So we need a very thin, high resolution cut. We do axial and coronal. There's no, uh, you cannot depend on the axial only. You can't depend on the coronal only. You have to get both of them uh, available for yourself. We like the, the two mil cuts. One mil cut as well will, will be good. The too much cut is not the best. And usually, if you have a good radiologist with you who've been trained to do this, they know where to do their cuts when they adjust the cuts. So we give you the numbers that you need, like eight high quality cuts, better than dozens of them. Uh, also, the mainly we use the bone window. That contrast, soft tissue, and with the contrast usually is uh, basically if you think there is a complication, but we don't usually do it as a routine. So going to the... Um, the uh, axial cuts. So simply, that's the first first um, cuts that we need to see. As I said before, five or six cuts um, in a concentrated areas are very important. So this is the skull base, and in each cut of them, that you will find there is um, landmark that you need to see. Okay. So the best um, or the, the landmark that we would like to see here in the first spot in the skull base is called the dugbo, which is the jaguar foramina and the inferior petrus uh, inferior sinus. So um, let me point it the pointer to those. Let me get back again. So is that available for you? Yeah. So so this is the area. So it's it's similar to the a duck. Um, a head, and this is the, the bell of the duck. So this is the two parts of the jugular foramina, and the bas nervosa and the bas and the bas uh, vascularis. So those are the two point of fits. And you can see at that time, uh, or if you look into the pathology, you can see if there is a glomus, for example, how uh, this side or this uh, nicely spiky bone will be destroyed. Also, this is called the, the crutch, which is the area between the, uh, the venous system and the arterial system, which is the carotid. You can see this uh, arrow is, the, is uh, indicated the uh, internal carotid artery. So simply, we, we don't look to a lot of things. We, I can show you where is the, for example, the, uh, the uh, foramen oval, the other sides, the, all of this is not really related much. But if you want to go for further, I can, the, this is the foramens that we are looking for, which is the foramens of the spinosum and the foramen of the valve. But they are not the main landmark of the pathology. Then the, the, the main landmark for the pathology is this, the ductal, and also the uh, bone marrow denial uh, or the bony denialination of the skull base. If this uh, like, um, are you searching for um, malignant thyroid external? So this is again, this is the ductal. Um, this is nicely the, the 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 duck and the expel, so we can see it's it's um, it's similar to it. We go into the next cut is will be the at the uh, the basal cochlear turn. So the the basal cochlear turn is like a smile, so we call it a cochlear smile. 
So if you're looking to, uh, for, for example, for a congenital anomalies, this is the area that you would look for, uh, which is the hypoplasia of the cochlea. In the same cuts, you can see another uh, landmark. So our next landmark is called the aqueduct. So this is the cochlear aqueduct, and it's like a trumpet. So we call it the trumpet. And as you can see, it's, it's nicely there with the end of it. So why we need this? Uh, it's a more likely to be a surgical landmark if you want to go for retrocochlear uh, removal of a tumor. So as I said before, we, we search for a specific cut. So this is the second cut. Um, so the first cut, you're going to see the duck bill or the uh, skull base. Second cut will be for us uh, for the basal turn of the cochlea and the trumpets or the cochlear aqueduct. Third cut we are searching for is the one that has the, um, the one and a half turn of the cochlea. So one and a half turn of the cochlea looks like the horn. That's why we call it the horn cut. So the horn cuts because it looks like the horn up there. And as you can see as well, uh, a kind of a Mundini uh, dysplasia. Um, as the, you can see it or the Kuwaka, any kind of anomalies that you would like to see. We're going to see in the next one, the next, um, next cut, which is the fourth cut. We're searching for different uh, bits in this cut, which is very important cuts. We search for the internal auditromatis. Which call it the funnel, so it's like a fun, uh, funnel shape. So, as you can see here in that area, and the nerve inside it. You can't see the nerve, but at least it, it, with a patient, for example, uh, that you um, who have a or claustrophobic, that you looking for any destruction of the uh, of the internal vitreous, it would tell you whether there's a tumor or not. It's not really specific, but it can tell you if uh, there is a large one. At least this funnel will be more wide. Also, in the four cuts, we have the ice cream cone and the ice cream, uh, the, uh, the what's called the our uh, glass uh, our, um, bit or shape um, area. So the our glass is mainly for the additus at antrum. This is the area, the, the narrow area, but up is the attic. Below is the antrum. So the attic and the antrum and attic is at the antrum is the hourglass. The ice cream cone, which all almost of people knows, is the uh, head of the milius and the head of incus, which is the ossicles. So you can see if there's any uh, discontinuation or frozen attic, for example, disease, all of these points that then gonna comes later. Also in the four cuts, we have the, the dot which is the posterior semicircular canal. So a lot of a lot of landmarks in the fourth cut. As I said before, if the radiologists give you this cut nicely, you can see a lot of things there. We go as well from that point, which we call it the packet hand, handle. It's like this is the uh, packet and this is the handle of the packet, which is the, the lateral semicircular canal. So, and then also we can see the fission nerve, which will come later. Okay. So if we go down, uh, sorry, uh, if we go a little bit up again, we have something called the slit. The slit is the aqueduct, the vestibular aqueduct. We have a cochlear aqueduct, which is at the level of the basal turn. So if you go up, at the level of the uh, the uh, vestibule, you will find the aqueduct, which is you can detect it whether there is a dilated aqueduct uh, or not uh, by measuring it uh, exactly. We go to the top cuts, which is the number five or the number six, is the the snake eyes, which is the semicircular canal, the superior semicircular canals. So I'm gonna. Pass again into what I've said before, just simply and uh, just the cuts that we need. It's five or six cuts only to go to the basal one, which is the ductal as a landmark, going for the second one, the cochlear smile, going for the third one, which is the, um, uh, the um, sorry, the same cut, which is the uh, trumpet, 
point for the third cut, which is we can see the horn, which is the basal, uh, the middle and apical turn of the cochlea, and then the funnel in the fourth, as well as the ice cream, uh, which is the handle of the milius, and the hourglass, which is the attic and the entry. The dot, which is the posterior semicircular canal, and the last one is the bucket handle, which is the lateral semicircular canal. Going for another cut, which is the uh, slit, which is the vestibular aqueduct. And the last landmark we are searching for it is the snake eye, which is the superior semicircular canal. And this is the um, like kind of the acromus and what it's uh, uh, related to. So the next step is, as we said, we can see uh, landmarks in the axial, but not all of the landmarks are in the axial, or you can see it well. The best is to, to correlate the coronal with axial. Sometimes you, you go for the sagittal, but the sagittal is not really the, the, the most important, and we use it for certain uh, pathologies. So going for the coronal, the same, we have like a, six to seven cuts as well, searching for each, in each cut a landmark. So the first landmark that we have here is the, uh, in the coronal cut, is what we call it the siphon. So it's the carotid artery. And it's, you can see here, let me just point. So this is the, um, the siphon, this is the carotid artery. And you can see that this is the TMG and the TMG is here, and we have a nice protection, natural protection, which is the style of process, which is easily that if it's not there, it's that you can uh, kill anyone easily by punching him in the TMG, because right? the bone will go into the carotid artery and easily die, but luckily that we have this spiky there to protect us. So, this is in the first cuts. So we have the TMG, we have the siphon uh, or the carotid artery, and we have this style of process. Okay. In the same cuts, what we have here, we have something called the inverted triangle. So the inverted triangle is the station tube. We can see also the station tube in the axial, but it's here is more prominent um, um, in the coronal cuts. And the same, what we can see, is the styloid, the carotid, and the TMG. So, and then if you go to the next cut in the coronal, we are looking to see the snail or the cochlea. Um, so we have the snail and the snail's eyes. So the cochlea is like the snail, okay, like this one, and the eyes up there is the snail eyes, which is the labyrinthine and the tympanic part of the fissure nerve. So we have the snail and the eyes up there, which is the snail's eyes, which is the, tympan the, tympa the tympanic and the labyrinthine. This is the labyrinthine, which is medial lateral, is the tympanic fissure nerve. Going down to the same cuts that we have, we're still in the second cuts. So we have the one of the ossicles, usually the milius that is there. And sometimes we can see the uh, upper bit, which is the, um, the uh, here is the scutum, and this is the cog, which is um, the continuation of the tympanal mastoid uh, sutures, or the corona sutures. Okay. Going down to the tip ring, as I said, the tip ring um, tip, which is the scutum. You can see it here in the same cut as well. and the second cut, which is the fourth cut. So the scutum could be seen in the third and the fourth cut as well. Okay, let's go to the fourth cut because it have a lot of landmarks that we need to know. So we're gonna see the same as the funnel that we have seen before, which is the internal detrimates. And you can see the crest, which is the ridge that separated the upper contents of the, um, the internal detrimates and the lower one. As we learned before, the seven up, which is the um, uh, fissure nerve in the upper part of it, and the superior uh, vestibular nerve. The lower part is the coke down. Uh, despite I don't like both of them, coke or seven, but that's fine. Coke down is um, for the cochlea, 
and also the uh, inferior vestibular nerve. So the crest is the one that separated the two of them together. Okay, all right. So what else that we can see here? Uh, we can see also the vestibule. We can see the lateral semicircular canal, and we can see also the superior semicircular canal. And unfortunately, it seemed to be like a very, very fancy, but not really the best to be seen is that the you can see the stavis um, or the ossicles as well, uh, which is the third one. Um, we can see the milius sometimes, uh, um, which is here, sorry, the incus uh, in this cut. So this cuts have the, um, the, um, the incus, but cuts have the stavis, which is, to be honest, the scans are not the high resolution to show it much. And sometimes it's better when the patient have a little bit of a tilt as well. Again, so if we go to the uh, next cut, we will see part of the vestibule, which is the, we call it the inverted tear drop, which is the um, round window niche. So the oval window is in the previous cut, which is the third cut, but the fourth cut will be the inverted um, tear. Uh, uh, <clears throat> teardrop and the um, here is the uh, round window and the niche is that one which is the cover of the round window. Sometimes you can find the cover, sometimes no and it depends uh, also in the anatomy there's a lot of variation. I've seen a lot of them more vertical, some of them a little bit horizontal and the angulation, different angulation as well. And then if we go to the fifth cut, we have the finger or the three fingers, which is um, the vestibule down, lateral semicircular, and the superior semicircular, uh, semicircular there. Uh, okay, and then the last uh, cut or the sixth cut that we can see, um, um, or the, it can be the sixth or the seven, seven cuts. So we have the bulb, okay, or the, <clears throat> the uh, sigmoid uh, bulb, and we can see also in the very, very beginning one is that we can see um, sometimes the, the jugular bulb as well, which is here, and sometimes we find it a bit dehiscent or, or not there, with, which can cause the apparent uh, or the high jugular bulb and pulse down tenets. And the last cut, which is the seventh one, which is the J. Um, or, or the inverted J shape, uh, and it, this is the vestibular aqueduct in the um, coronal cuts. So just recapping what we have uh, said before, we have like five, uh, six to seven cuts. Uh, the um, first cuts, we are searching for the carotid, the uh, styloid, the TMG, the inverted triangle for the uh, station tube, the snail, uh, which is the cochlea, the snail eyes, which is the facial nerve, also the um, jugular bulb, uh, going for the ossicles, the milius, um, the, uh, the incus, stabis, the internal detrimatus, the crest or the transverse ridge or the transverse crest, the uh, vestibule, lateral and superior semicircular canal, inverted drop, um, sorry, the lateral, the just got the lateral and the posterior semicircular canal. The, and then the inverted J shape, which is the um, stable aqueduct. And then the roller coaster, which is the fission nerve, and how we find the fission nerve in the coronal and the axial. So we're going to start with the axial cuts. So starting from the internal detrimatus. So this is. Um, um, the internal detrimatus, we have like an inverted V or the people who from Arabic countries knows uh, number eight. In, uh, so it's like an eight or the inverted V. This more bets there. So this is the, uh, the labyrinthine and the tympanic part of the fission nerve. And then we'll have the, uh, the uh, fission, tympanic fission nerve from that, this area and just at the edge of it, also we can find the geniculate ganglion. And it's very important to see this because um, for finding um, 
a tumor in the geniculate ganglion, the MRI scan is not sensitive. The only sensitive is a CT scan when you find the destruction and the widening of this, uh, um, the widening of the uh, the area of the, um, the V shape. So we have also the tympanic fissure nerve here, and then end it with the uh, what we know that the W shape uh, area of the sinus tympani and the fissure recess and the fissure nerve is here, and then when it comes out in the tympanomastoid uh, foramen. And then we have the fissure nerve in the um, the uh, coronet, starting from the same bits that we have said before: the snail and the snail eyes, tympanic, and the uh, and the inficial geniculate, tympanic and the um, tympanic and um, sorry, the labyrinthine part of it. And then in we what we can see here, it's 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 an infomedial to the um, to the stabus, but unfortunately, this is not the, the right one to be seen. Uh, also, it's here, so it's intermediate to the lateral, um, um, the, the uh, lateral semicircular canal, and then at the end is coming down from uh, at just in front uh, or at the level of the inverted J of the aqueduct. And I think that's. Uh, Presentation. If anyone wants to ask any question, just write it down in the comments, and and HO will just have a look in it. Um, the presentation is is present in my ResearchGate uh, uh, site, so you, so you can get it on there. So I, I've already uploaded. So anyone wants to download the presentation, it's available. I have some YouTube um, videos for the endoscopic ear surgery. Who's interested about uh, endoscopic ear surgery? He can. Um, watch them as well. And thank you for uh, listening the, to my presentation. So um, thank you, everyone. Um, our next guest will be um, uh, Professor uh, Altman. Uh, Burak, are you ready to present? Do you want me to put the presentation on or you can uh, do it from I, yourself? I, uh, I'll I, stop sharing. I, uh, I want to share uh, from my computer. Uh, yeah, it's it okay. Up. Yeah, at the up, yeah. Yeah, share. Uh, content only, side button. Uh, Greetings to all listeners and speakers uh, from Turkey. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank to Dr. Abdulrahman for this gracious invitation. Uh, without further ado, I will move on to my presentation titled Anatomy of MRI Scan, Temporal Bone and Skull Base. Uh, even though we typically rely on tomography for anatomy of the temporal region, there are situations where we uh, may require the use of MRI imaging. Uh, CT images provide a map of tissue density uh, where white areas indicate high density structures, as you see in the upper picture. On the other hand, MRI images briefly represent the energy state of protons within the tissues. Uh, for, this, for this reason, uh, MRI can produce various images that uh, highlight different soft, soft tissue types especially those containing a high amount of fat and or water. Uh, the brightness of an MRI image corresponds to the high signal emitted by the protons. Uh, so uh, when you uh, compare the upper and lower image, you can see that CT mainly provides details of bony structures, while the MRI provides very high detail concerning soft tissue tissues, uh, bony structures always appear dark in all sequences, as you see. Uh, let's move on. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about some basic MRI sequences before moving on. Uh, there are two uh, main MRI sequences characterized by signal creation and tissue differentiation. Uh, concerning signal creation, uh, T1 uh, signal intensity is related 
to the speed of realignment with the magnetic field. Namely, uh, the more quickly the protons realign, re the higher the T1 signal. Uh, on the other hand, uh, T2 signal intensity is related to the speed of proton speed dephasing. Namely, the slower the dephasing, the higher the T2 signal intensity. Uh, if you if you look to the dis tissue differentiation, uh, protons in fat realign quickly with high energy and produce a strong T1 signal. As a result, fat-rich tissues are highlighted in T1-weighted images. Besides, uh, protons in the wat in water deface slowly. As a result, uh, water is highlighted in two T2-weighted images. Uh, and uh, in my slide, you see at the right side T1 and T2 sequences of a case from our clinic uh, with, uh, with encephalomalacia and pseudomeningocell uh, with a Tegman defect. Uh, as you can see in the image above, structures containing liquid appear in dark colors. For example, the cerebrospinal fluid and the membranous labyrinth. Uh, appear black. Additionally, the left temporal occipital region uh, appears darker. Uh, can you see my mouse here or pointer? Okay. Uh, appears darker compared to the right due to liquefaction necrosis resulting from tissue loss. To distinguish whether this is a mass or fluid, we need to look at the T2 image. As seen uh, on T2, it's consistent with encephalomalacia, which is characterized by high signal intensity. Uh, furthermore, on T2, the membranous labyrinth uh, can be visualized in much greater detail due to its fluid content, is, as you see uh, in the lower uh, picture or image. There are some other uh, specialized MRI sequences also. Different uh, specialized images, MRI images are frequently used in specific clinical settings to highlight structures or pathological processes. Here are some common examples that we that are commonly used. Uh, the first one is STIR, also called short tau inversion recovery. Uh, these are images uh, highly sensitive to water uh, and the pulse sequence timing is designed to suppress signals from fatty tissues. So this results in bright water-only images. Uh, by comparing stir images with uh, standard T1 images, it is possible to determine the relative amounts of water and fat in specific body parts. On the other side, in flare images, fluid attenuated inversion recovery, this is uh, the signal uh, from free fluid such as uh, CSF, is suppressed when compared with T2 image. Uh, high signal seen uh, on these images indicates a pathological process such as infection, tumor, or uh, areas of the demyelination. Uh, T2 star, or also called as gradient echo image, can be used to highlight the presence of blood products. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, diffusion weighted imaging, or DWI, and uh, ADC images are viewed together. Uh, areas of high signal on the uh, DWI image and low signal on the ADC image indicate restricted diffusion. It's an indicator of pathological processes of cell death, such as, <clears throat> such as infarction, cancer, or abscess formation. Uh, the image you see in the middle uh, is a T1 uh, image belonging to a case of cholesteatoma. As you see uh, on the left side, uh, uh, isodense uh, mass can be seen. <coughs> uh, in the image at the top right, the same section can be seen in the uh, DWI image where the mass has a high signal. Uh, on the bottom right, an ADC image is seen. You can see the image as isodense. Uh, MRI has become a crucial imaging tool for evaluating the temporal bone and lateral skull base. It aids in assessing normal anatomical structures, uh, detecting vestibular schwannomas, identifying inflammatory and or infectious processes, and identifying residual and or recurrent cholesteatoma. 
It's also commonly used for pre- and post-operative evaluations, particularly in patients with vestibular schwannomas and those undergoing cochlear implantation. Despite its widespread use, many ENT specialists as well as radiologists may encounter difficulties in interpreting MRI results. And on the right side, you see a T1-weighted image with contrast enhancement. It's a case of vestibular schwannoma at the cerebellar pontin angle. <coughs> In, in the following uh, slides, I will show some of the no normal anatomical structures of the inner ear in a 35-year-old female patient using 3D cis MRI sequences acquired with 1.5 T Siemens magnetom sola. 44 images of the posterior fossa were obtained with uh, 0.6 millimeter thickness. Uh, MRI images were post-treated with Horos, which is a uh, free uh, software to obtain uh, multiplanar reconstruction in uh, two different opti uh, oblique sagittal planes. Uh, the images uh, were then cropped focus on the right temporal bone and cerebellopontin angle. On the right side, uh, you can see the basal. Uh, let me show. Uh, sorry. On the right side, you can see uh, the basal, middle, and uh, apical half turn uh, of cochlea, uh, facial nerve uh, here, uh, vestibular uh, here. Sorry, here you can see the facial nerve, vestibular cochlear nerve, and uh, superior uh, vestibular nerve, uh, inferior branch of vestibular nerve here can be seen. You can also see here the vestibule. Burak, uh, just uh, the presentation, please, okay? Just okay. share the presentation again, please. It can't you see? Sorry. Okay. Can you see now? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, now, uh, I will, uh, I'm going to show some key anatomic structures in this video. Uh, just uh, moving on the video, uh, it's constructed from T2 weighted MRI sequences on axial plane. Uh, can you see uh, my uh, mouse uh, on the picture? Yes, yes, Brock, thank you. Okay, uh, now, sorry. Uh, if you if we uh, propagate uh, uh, first of all, uh, sorry, this slide should be nice. Uh, the right side is the uh, inner uh, medial part. The left side is lateral part. Uh, the upper uh, part is the uh, anterior side. Uh, the inferior part is the posterior. Uh, just for navigate, I tell them. If you, if we uh, propagate, you can see the tentorial cerebelli mm. here, and this is the uh, uh, cisterna of the pons. Uh, if we 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 are propagating from the uh, upper to the lower, and viewing from the uh, below. Uh, in that uh, here you see a, a more uh, hippo intense area. This is the otic ca capsule uh, uh, because it's a bony structure. It appears uh, darker uh, than the uh, uh, brain tissue. If we propagate, now we see the uh, membranous starting to see the membranous labyrinth. This is the anterior semicircular ca canal, and here starts the pontocerebellar cistern. Uh, which will uh, communicate with the in, uh, cistern of the internal ear canal. Uh, let me move on. Then, uh, 
Now, uh, you, you, here you can see uh, the cistern of the internal ear canal, uh, which communicates with the cistern of the uh, pontocerebellar cistern here. Mm. If we move on again, now uh, we, we start to see the facial nerve here, and uh, the uh, superior vestibular nerve also appears uh, in the uh, internal acoustic canal. Then, if we propagate, This is the uh, facial nerve, uh, and uh, the, uh, we start to see the uh, inferior vestibular nerve here also. And the cochlea also appears. This is the basal turn. Uh, here, the black uh, hippo-intense area is the modulus. This is the uh, middle turn, and uh, this is the apical half turn, inferior vestibular nerve. And uh, we start to see the vestibule. Even uh, we may delineate the uh, macul uh, mac macula of utricle as a uh, little hippo intense area here. If then let's move on. Uh, then lateral semicircular canal appears. And uh, we, uh, this is the internal carotid artery, hyper intense. Uh, this is the uh, sigmoid sinus. This is the uh, jugular foramen. We can see the bony uh, structures in the MRI. We can see uh, as uh, black areas. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, slide. And uh, this is a different uh, section, oblique segital uh, on uh, uh, semicircular canals. Let's uh, move on here also. Now, uh, we this is perpendicular to the internal acoustic meatus, so we can uh, see the relations of the vestibular cochlear nerve, facial nerve, and inferior and superior vestibular nerves. So this is the entrance of uh, vestibular cochlear nerve. This is the uh, facial nerve. If we move on, uh, this is the flocculum uh, of uh, cerebellum. Here is the cerebellum. If we move on, uh, this is the facial cochlear nerve. Uh, the vestibular, uh, the vestib vestibular nerve and cochlear nerve separates. If we move on, uh, uh, we yes, this is the facial nerve, cochlear nerve, and vest vestibular nerve. Here, uh, the vestibular nerve divides into uh, superior vestibular nerve and inferior vestibular nerve. Now, the basal turn of cochlea uh, appears here. If we move on, uh, the uh, medial turn, and uh, we can see the uh, apical turn. So uh, you can see here the vestibule and uh, uh, the uh, anterior semicircular canal and posterior semicircular canal. The common cruise can be seen here also. Uh, the lateral semicircular canal can be seen also. This, this is the end of this video. Uh, this is another uh, video that uh, we uh, see the uh, lateral skull base and uh, ear uh, in a more wider uh, window. Here uh, you can see the internal carotid artery, cover cavernous part of the internal carotid artery, basal. Uh, artery can also be seen. Uh, if you move on, you can see the petrous part of the internal carotid artery. Yes, here we can see. Uh, we we can also see the uh, 
facial nerve, vestibular cochlear nerve, uh, the cerebellopontin cistern. Uh, but uh, from because we we are looking from a wider uh, perspective, uh, the intricate details cannot be seen uh, from this uh, image. Uh, cyst images are more valuable for uh, more intricate uh, details. Uh, as you see, the uh, mastoid middle ear region uh, appears uh, dark and we can we cannot see uh, details but uh, if there is a, a soft tissue in the mastoid or uh, in the middle ear uh, we can uh, use mri for uh, differential diagnosis in different uh, images uh, we can uh, think on uh, the nature of that uh, tissue Uh, this is uh, my uh, end of my uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I, I was just uh, about to tell you that you have like three, four minutes left. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Barak. Uh, that's you on time. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, we, the next guest is uh, Professor Alam, Ahmed Alam. You. OK, can you see it now? Yes. OK, when I move with you. Yes, now it's OK. Yeah. OK, and now is it OK? Yeah, but I would say put it in the presenting mood. Just push the button down there. OK, it's like already. This. Can you can you see it now? It's if it's working. Or yeah, not? But you share it. You're sharing it uh, not in the presenting mood. It's like the. Oh, oh, okay. OK, it, it doesn't allow me to do it, actually. I don't know. Yeah, do it from outside the uh, teams. Yeah, I'm doing it through the outside teams, but it doesn't allow me to do that. Yeah, I'm already on the presenting team. I'm presenting on my screen already. Oh, it's really a shame. Enable, enable edit. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, uh, doesn't, it doesn't allow me, yeah. OK, let me see this. Can you see it now? Is it no. is it screen now? No. Yeah. No. no? It's fine. It's, sorry, I know this is will be technically difficult, but is it better now? No, no. I, we, you're not on share now. Okay, let me let me see. Okay, is it better now? Kind of, yeah. Okay. So. Okay. So as I said before, it's a through the common pathological finding uh, in temporal bone. So I divide them into the inflammatory, traumatic, ne neoplastic, and vascular anomalies, uh, as well as the autosclerosis. So if we go to the inflammatory condition, you will go for uh, in the external detrical canal. The most common that I usually encounter is the external detrical canal cholesteatoma. Uh, keratosis obturans, malignant otitis externa, also uh, chronic otitis externa with false fondus formation, and in the middle ear, I can, you, of course, you all know about cholesteatoma and the chronic otitis media and OMAs. So if we go to the first, uh, it's external auditory canal cholesteatoma is a rare lesion with an incidence of about 0 0.1 to 0.5. And it can be either spontaneous or idiopathic, or also after happen after doing surgery or trauma or radiotherapy. It's very common in the older age, and uh, with uh, there is and the patient present with dull aching pain as well as otorrhea. Pathologically, you can see a local invasion of the lining squamous epithelium of the external auditory canal into the bone below it, and uh, ruining the canal wall, and as well as the uh, uh, Mastoid. Uh, this picture is a very nice picture where you where it's really very important to differentiate between external auditory canal and the cholesterol is that you can see that it's uh, it happen it have a small entrance and it start invading down into the bone in in uh, the opposite to exactly to uh, keratosis obturans where it's the the epithelium as well is expanding the bone uh, and it have a broad opening. 
So on a CT scan image, the, the lesion is characterized by focal soft tissue within the external auditory canal, typically in the inferior wall, with erosion extending into the underlying bone. These imaging findings are non-specific. But it can sometimes with a lesion invading the bone, you need to exclude that there is a carcinoma there happening. Here is a CT scan where you can see the, the uh, external auditory. So this is a CT scan, a coronal cuts. You can see the middle ear here, the external auditory canal, and you can see there is a lesion which is going into the uh, bone of the external auditory canal. Also, there is another picture where you can see that there is this is extensive, uh, extensive uh, cholestatoma is going in from the external auditory canal into the mastoid as well, and it's eroding the mastoid. So if you go to keratosis obturans, uh, is represent an expansile accumulation of the keratine debris within the external auditory canal. Uh, in contrast to the external auditory canal cholesteatoma, it occurs in younger patients and tend to be bilateral. So this, this, the, the keratosis obturans is bilateral, but external auditory canal cholesteatoma is most often uh, unilateral. Clinically, the patient have severe pain and conductive hearing loss, and you, uh, it can be associated with other diseases as well, but in the CT scan, the most important thing is that you can see diffusion widening of the external auditory canal uh, with a epidermis or a opacity, which is have as as we call it as a smooth scalloping of the surrounding bone, but there is no erosion uh, erosion or parotitis. So it's very very crucial to differentiate between keratosis obturans on CT scan as well as from the uh, external auditory canal uh, cholesteatoma is that it, there is no erosion in keratose obturans. Saying that, sometimes uh, the keratose obturans can be very severe and extending to the cause nerve compression over the facial nerve as well. The next is inflammatory is the malignant otitis externa. Uh, of course, as you all know, it happens in older patients and it's more an immunocompromised patient and diabetic. On a CT scan, in the malignant test external showed soft tissue thickening in the external auditory canal, as well as you can see some erosions in the external auditory canal as well, as well as the mastoid. Uh, sometimes this infection can go beyond that and extend into the, the, the skull base as well, as well as the temporal bone and cause uh, um, to and destruction to the clivus as well as jugular foramen as well as the lower cranial nerve. We, of course, as you all know, malignant otitis externa. It's crucial to have a CT scan and an MRI scan. Uh, the CT scan is mainly to exclude any uh, to see the extent of the erosion, and the MRI scan is mainly to to see the soft tissue uh, extent as well as the progression of the disease. So we do an MRI scan as a baseline start medical treatment and then do another MRI scan which shows how much the, uh, there is progression, how much the, the, there is response to the disease. Uh, the changes on the CT scan with malignant as externa takes longer time to resolve. So it's not, it's not the, the uh, first line or uh, guidance in uh, if, to see if there is any progression of the disease or not. Okay, so next is chronic otitis externa and false fundus uh, is something which I, we usually see here in the UK is that with patients, especially older patients, where they have chronic otitis externa, chronic inflammation in the, in the ear canal, thickening in the ear canal, narrowing, and they end up with having what we call it as a false fundus. And clinically in the false fundus, the patients have a very thick scar tissue and, uh, and skin over the tympanic membrane. It's not discharging, it's not inflamed. This is the end stage of the chronic otitis externa. So we see that it's very important when you see this picture of uh, in, in an ear canal and the patient suffer from conductive hearing, we arrange for them to have a CT scan. If you look at the CT scan, you will see that the middle ear is completely free, the mastoid is completely free on both sides. But you could see that just over the tympanic membrane, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, uh, there is a soft, tissue, which is a scar tissue, it can take all the bony canal and sometimes extend up to the extent to the to the uh, cartilaginous part. It differs. The thickness differs from one side to another. Also, the thickness is very important in the uh, determination of the amount of uh, conductive hearing loss the patients have. 
then if we go move to the middle ear, so we discussed the, the external auditory canal cholesteatoma, keratosis obturans, malignant otitis externa, and uh, as well as the chronic otitis externa. Then we move to the middle ear with uh, to differentiate between the two common diseases, which is the cholesteatoma and the chronic otitis media. So in cholesteatoma, as you all know, it's, it's believed to be arise from the retraction pocket and the eardrum is usually in the parse uh parse uh, uh, uh tensa but sometimes it can uh, parse flaccida but sometimes it can happen post superior in the parse tensa as well and it starts enlarging gradually with time and exfoliating and uh, and invading the bone uh, surrounding it the most important criteria in the in the diagnosis of of cholesteatoma is uh is first of all is clinically but also we see that there is bone erosion with cholesteatoma so cholesteatoma CT scan uh, criteria is first in soft tissue mass in the middle ear, especially if it's located in turbosac space. So I start suspecting cholesteatoma. Uh, in advanced cholesteatoma, the presence of aerated part of the middle ear the, um, um, denotes that this is a mass, not an effusion. So if I see a non-dependent mass in the middle ear with the rest of the middle ear is clear and it's only in the attic and the upper part of the of the middle ear, so I suspect that this is cholesteatoma. Uh, non-dependent, as we said, non-dependent soft tissue. The and fourth, sclerotic mastoid bone. Uh, this is one of the, the observations. So in the pathology of the cholesteatoma, cholesteatoma actually cause, uh, uh, causes osteitis as well as sclerosis of the mastoid bone itself. Uh, so we can see in some some cases that there is sclerosis in one side and uh, and the no sclerosis on the other. Uh, also, the bony scrotum, uh, bony erosion of the scutum or lateral semicircular canal or tegment tympani or the long process of the incus suspect that there is cholesteatoma. Here we have, we can have a look. We can see that this is uh, this is a the right side which seems to be completely fine. You can see the scutum nicely in a coronal cut. You can see the the head of the malleus and the handle of the malleus and the tympanic membrane with well aerated middle ear. On on the other side, you can see that this scutum, which should be here, is already eroded, and you can see that there is invasion of the cholesteatoma. And as we said, it is only uh, in the attic area. There is the rest of the middle ear is clear. So this is a cholesteatoma. Also, one of the things that you can see with the cholesteatoma is that you can see some erosion of the lateral semicircular canal. Again, this is an axial cut of the CT uh, of the uh, of the uh, CT temporal bone. You can see the lateral semicircular canal, and this is the superior semicircular canal as described before. And you can see that there is it's not complete signet ring. There is a bit, there is opacity which is already eroding the bone uh, and which is causing a, a, a fistula and erosion of the lateral semicircular canal. Also, you can uh, also you can see how much the and, and you can see that there you can see it in the coronal cut that there is also erosion of the lateral semicircular canal. The other tool to diagnose cholesteatoma is MRI scan, which I personally consider one of the important keys in recent years. And there is many literature speaking about the role of DW imaging in, in MRI scan. So cholesteatoma in MRI scan showed mixed antinistin in T1 and high antinistin in T2. But the most important is the diffusion weighted imaging, which is can differentiate cholesteatoma from other abnormalities, especially granulation tissue. Uh, doing an MRI scan in cholesteatoma is very crucial, if you, especially if you are doing a canal wall up or a combined approach to panoplasty, where you want to diagnose if there is any sort of or uh, of recurrence. So you can do an MRI scan with diffusion weighted imaging to instead of doing a second look. Also, there is a with a very very high uh, specificity and uh, and and uh, uh, and all with perfect results as well. But okay. So if you look in the MRI scan, uh, this is the cholesteatoma and the MRI scan. This is in a T1, you can see it, it have a mixed intensity. And in a T2, you can see that it is hyper intense. But this is this is the very important picture, which is the in the, in the DW imaging, which you ask your radiologist to do it for you, is you can see a wide bulb, high intense coming up uh, in the screen. This is shows you the, the amount of uh, cholesteatoma and it's a very highly specific for cholesteatoma as well. Also, it can be if there is any intracranial extension of the cholesteatoma. So why I, the other 
inflammatory disease in the middle ear is is chronic otitis media with the fusion or even um, uh, uh, otitis media with the fusion or even acute otitis media sometimes as well. You and to differentiate between it and the cholesteatoma, you will see opacity filling the middle ear, all the middle ear. This is the uh, this is opacity filling the middle ear, but you can see here they have put a grommet before in this trial, and you can see the key thing, which I personally think is that you can see the mastoid is fully filled with fluid here, and you can see trabeculae, very nice, no sclerosis, well aerated mastoid. But it was well aerated, but it's now filled with fluid. So this indicates that this is fluid in the mastoid, and it, it decreased the susceptibility that there is any cholesteatoma. So we spoke about inflammatory. The next step is to speak about trauma. Trauma of the temporal bone can cause this uh, hematympanum, the manic membrane perforation, temporal bone fracture, and CSF leaks. So and uh, temporal bone fractures, as a quick, as you all know, there it can be classified into longitudinal uh, temporal bone fractures, which passes from the external auditory canal parallel to the internal auditory meatus and passes into the middle ear itself. Uh, or it can be transverse uh, uh, fractures, which can take any part of the temporal bone, but it's the most crucial when it's around the uh, otic capsule, which have the uh, the uh, inner ear and also the labyrinthine part of the facial nerve. So if you have a longitudinal fracture, it will pass through the external auditory canal and the mastoid, then in the middle ear, causing some mainly uh, uh, fracture of the ossicles and causing hemotympanum and conductive hearing loss and the lower risk for the facial nerve, uh, about 20%. But in, in the transverse part, you have a higher risk of facial nerve injury, about eight more than 80% with a uh, sense in your hearing loss and the loss of balance as well. So this is an example of a uh, temporal bone fracture. You can see that there is a temporal bone that's running from the cortex down the down on parallel to the external auditory canal going into the ear, and you can see it extending even into the inner ear itself. Um, this patient will have facial nerve uh, palsy from, from this fracture. Uh, and this is another CT scan. You can see it on the right ear and on the left ear. You can see there is a transverse fracture going through the uh, the uh, the otic capsule, the cochlea, the vestibule, and reaching even to the genicleate ganglion, where it you can have the, the can cause injury to the facial nerve. Other findings that you can find in a uh, in temporal bone fracture is you can find some uh, air bubbles, or uh, you can see in some pneumocephalus, or which, as you can see here, going in the uh, it can be extra dural. You can see what's called a pneumo labyrinth, which is where air fill, filling the inner ear as well. Uh, you can see air bubbles around the uh, temporomandibular joint. And you can see here the fractures as well. And you can see that here there is a fluid in the mastoid suggesting that this is high hemotympanum. Uh, also, you can see this is there is a timber bone fracture, and you can see here this is the dislocation. If you compare it to the other side, there is dislocation between the uh, head of the uh, head of the malleus and the incus, and there is no and the, the, it's normal on the other side. Uh, so we spoke about inflammatory, spoke about uh, um, uh, uh, trauma. Then we go move to the next step, which is neoplastic. So the most common in neoplastic disease in the ear is the exostosis, osteoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and glomus and hemangioma in the middle ear. And in the temporal bone, it's mainly uh, vestibular schwannoma, meningioma, and endolymphatic sac tumor. So exostosis, a uh, quick refresh, it's a multiple society, and you find it bilateral, and it's very common with uh, patients who, uh, or people uh, uh, deal with cold water, and they call it, uh, and surfers, they call it surfer ear. On a CT scan, you can find that there is narrowing of the bony external auditory canal as itself, and you can see very broad base, small bony swellings in the external auditory canal. As you all know, if there is no uh, conductive hearing loss and there is no uh, problems in the this, uh, wax 
uh, we don't need to do any any further management for these patients. In comparison, in the opposite side, there is the osteoma, which is less rare. You'll find it more uh, on the lateral part of the uh, of the bony external the canal. The, the osteoma usually the exostosis is mainly medial, but the osteoma is mainly lateral. Also, you can see if you see it's pedunculated, you can see that there is a small uh, peduncle or sp a small base. And it's all usually solitary on one side. Um, and in this CT scan, you can have a look. And uh, you see in this CT scan, there is the lesion here where you can see bony uh, 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 a bony lesion with a very narrow uh, um, base. And also, you can see soft tissue here. This soft tissue is a wax impacted or debris impacted behind the, this osteoma. This is a great indication to do a, a surgery for removal of this osteoma and allowing. Here to break. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma, of course, it's a huge subject, but it's uh, CT scan and MRI scan is very important uh, in diagnosis of the extent of the disease, and a tissue biopsy is the main cornerstone in treatment. Uh, patient with external auditorical, uh, external auditorical squamous cell carcinoma have a wrong, mostly they are elderly, having a long history of having a chronic ear and started to suffer from severe pain and bleeding in the recent days. You examine the ear, you start seeing that there is a, some lesion in the external auditory canal itself. And it's uh, and if you do a CT scan, you start seeing that there is huge destruction of the uh, of the uh, st structures on the mastoid. So you can see here, this is a CT scan. This is the uh, uh, inner ear. This is the temporal bone itself and the petrous apex. And you can see the tumor is extending and it's mouth eating all the mastoid itself and going into the external auditory canal itself. Uh, the next grow group of uh, our neoplastic legions is the glomus uh, glomus is a tumor which arises from the paraganglion cells which is present on the promontory of the cochlea around the jacobsian nerve or in the jugular foramen around the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve it happens may, more common in elderly and it's actually i found it uh, more common in female the most uh, most presenting symptom is pulsatile tinnitus most of the patients present with pulsatile tinnitus but also they can if it's really big it can cause hearing loss conductive hearing loss or pain and in advanced cases you can see the lower crane and nerves affection and this is a otoscopic view and you can see that here here there you have an intact embedding membrane and behind it you can see a small uh, which represent glomus tympanicum so the main two legions that uh the two or two subtypes of the glomus is glomus tympanicum and glomus jugular and the glomus, glomus tympanicum which arise in the middle ear is usually uh, is usually confined to the middle ear itself but in the uh, but uh, confined to the middle ear uh, but in the glomus jugular it starts from the jugular form and start invading into the into the middle ear itself so the difference between both is actually if there is a bone between the jugular foramen and, and and jugular vein and the middle ear. So you do a CT scan, you had a look, this is a coronal cut. You can see that the manic membrane, middle ear, inner ear, and there is dependent lesion there, okay? Clinically, you looked in the ear and it looks reddish, so it's most, it can be a, a glomus and the patient suffer from pulsatile tinnitus. And then the more you then you look on this bone if this bone is present most likely and and there is no other lesions around there is no mouth eaten appearance will, as we will look around so this most likely this is glomus tympanicum confined to the middle ear but if you look on the other side with which is this is a glomus jugular you can see that this bone is eroded already so this is the jugular foramen this is the axial view of another patient, you can see that there is a jugular foramen and there's a, a, the jugular bulb and there, the, this bone is eroded and then there is a legion which has started to come into the middle ear, even into the hypotomponum as well. So this is a typical picture of the glomus tympanicum. You can see it as a uh, as a uh, on the on the resting on the promontory. The rest of the middle ear. This is the mastoid completely clear, attic completely clear, and you can see it uh, just below the ossicles, between the ossicles and the promontory, and it's uh, it's arising from the Jacobsen nerves, and it's you can see it sometimes the origin is coming from 
in the hypotympanum. And again, this is in this coronal cut, you can see that there is the jugular bulb is completely uh, clear and there is a bony uh, bony septa between it and the jugular bulb. Another another picture you can see this is the small, very small, tiny legion which is the the glomus tympanicum, and there is a bony a bony bony wall between it and the jugular bulb. If you move to the glomus jugular, you can see that there is, here is the area if the jugular foramen and the area of the jugular bulb. You can see that there is a legion here, even on the CT scan which is eat its mouth eating surrounding it and also it's going into the uh, into the uh, the middle ear you can see it in this picture if we this patient had a contrast this is the arterial phase as well and you can see it's vascular and it's hyper intense other investigation that we can do for a glomus jugular is to do a angiography, which uh, to, to, to demonstrate the inten intense of the, the tumor as well as the feeding vessel, usually sending pharyngeal. And it's very useful if you, especially if we're doing glomus jugular, uh, is to uh, preoperatively is to do embolization. And you here is a picture where you can did an angiography. You can see that here was the the tumor, and once you did a a uh, uh, embolization, it's totally disappeared. Uh, so we did a CT scan for glomus, we did a angiography, and then we do an MRI scan. MRI scan is very characteristic, is to have what's called the salt pepper appearance on both T1 and T2. The salt and pepper, so it means white and black. So the salt represent, which is the white one, represent the blood brought products from hemorrhage, uh, or we call it slow flow. And the pepper, which is the black dots, which is the void. Or so black dots means void, doesn't give a signal. This is because there is blood moving in. So blood vessels without contrast give a blood picture, give a black picture on the MRI scan. So inside the tumor itself, you find areas of black dots, which is high, showing it's highly vascular because the blood vessels passing by and red salt, salt or white dots or whatever white structure. This is because of stagnant blood and the, the fibrous component of the glomus. Uh, and we, of course, we need to we need to differentiate it from other lesions as well, of course, and clinically it's very important. So this is uh, this is a different. This is the uh, MRI scan in, in different sequences. You can see this is a T1 and you can see still have the salt and pepper appearance, white dots, black dots. And you can see the lesions in the area of the hypo uh, of the jugular foramen. Uh, this is in T1. Uh, T1 where it's black and water is black, but if you T2 where it's uh, water is, is white, you can see it's still there is the lesion there is hyper intense and it's still there is black dots, white dots, salt and pepper appearance. You can see it is more obvious in a, this is a special sequence in the MRI scan. The the other uh, tumor which you can find it in the middle ear is hemangioma. Although it's very rare, the patient present with facial usually facial nerve palsy. It's very common in the area of the genicular ganglion. Facial nerve palsy come especially it comes with very uh, also gradually and comes with twitches as well. And it can happen uh, along the intratemporal course of the facial nerve and most commonly as we said in the genicular ganglion region. the CT scan you can see that there is expansile we call it honeycomb appearance so you can see there is on the CT similar to the salt and pepper it's in uh, on the on the CT scan in the hemangioma you can see white and black dots here but this white dots in, uh, showed uh, showing calcification and bone bone invasion as well so you can see it in the area of the of the genicular ganglion this patient, of course, we colorate with clinically if the patient have a uh, facial nerve palsy, twitches. So this possibly most likely to be hemangioma. 
uh, endolymphatic sac tumors. Uh, why I put the endolymphatic sac tumors? Because it's very characteristic, very, very characteristic. If a patient present with a hearing loss, did a CT scan, whatever the reason you have that MRI scan and CT scan for, uh, it's very the radiological uh, appearance of it is very characteristic. So on a CT scan, you see destruction of the of destructive process is seen on the dorsal surface of the petro, uh, uh, petrosal part of the temporal bone, and it's related to the uh, endolymphatic sac. Uh, and on MRI scan, usually we see an enhanced uh, uh, lesion on the scan. So here is this is the CT scan where we used to see it and we don't see it that much on the skull based MDTs, but actually once we see it, it's very, very characteristic. You can see that destructive lesion all uh, on the posterior wall of the of the temporal bone. So here should be that the posterior wall of the temporal bone, here the area of the endolymphatic sac, and you can see that there is a destruction going into the mastoid and the eroding into the middle ear, uh, the inner ear as well. And you do an MRI scan, and you can see that there is a uh, different uh, uh, different uh, with contrast and with, uh, with contrast and without contrast. And you can see that there is a uh, hyper intense and co having also some areas of uh, fluid inside and cysts. Uh, the next uh, scan is the vestibular schronoma. So as you all know, Vestibular schronoma is the most common tumor in the cerebellopontine angle, and it comes from the uh, around the uh, Schwann uh, cells and the, and the nerve sheath surrounding the, uh, the vestibular nerve, uh, the, the most commonly. But you can see that it's very, very common picture to see it, to see like a that's extending from the uh, internal determinators into the CBA angle. And you can see when the patient have contracts is very hyper intense and contrast. I brought this picture to differentiate it from the next one, which is meningioma. So meningioma is the second common uh, tumor in the in the uh, CBA angle. So if you look into these pictures, you will this is a mix of meningioma and schwannoma. So the first one, this is this is a schwannoma. This is a right side, uh, a right side schwannoma. You can see that there, it, this is in a T2. There is no contrast, and you can see that the, the schwannoma is extending from the external auditory canal. The sorry, it's from the internal auditory meatus and invading the CBA angle. And there is a small indentation in the uh, in the brain stem it's, uh, itself. This patient will need contrast. And you can see this if after having a contrast on another patient, this is how it looks like. Uh, but in, if you compare it to this one, this this lesion, there is th this lesion have a broad base. It's mainly related to the posterior surface of the temporal bone. So it's broad base, and usually it can have what's called a tail as well. So hyper intense part of the meninges as well, we call it as a tail. So and it's more homogeneous. This is a meningioma. So this is the radiological difference between in vestibular uh, vestibular schwannoma and the meningioma. Okay, so we spoke about we covered the the neoplastic part. I will go to quickly for two vascular abnormalities which we can see in patients who have a you do patient come with pulsatile tinnitus. You do an MRI scan or a CT. You find the CT scan and you can see there is a very the carotid artery is very apparent and it sh and it's coming out into the middle ear itself or in the hypotympanum. This is very important to pick up uh, while, so we diagnose that this is most likely the cause of the pulsatile tinnitus. And also it's very important if we are operating on this patient, we know that the, the bone, the carotid artery is not covered with bone. The other uh, an, um, abnormality, which is very important to know is the vascular dehiscent uh, jugular bulb. Uh, patient as well can can be presented with uh, with pulsatile tinnitus or uh, this is discovered accidentally and you can see it's very characteristic to have a the dilated this most probably this is the dominant uh, uh, jugular uh, vein uh, and you can see that there is a widening of the uh, of the jugular uh, bulb uh, and the jugular canal as well and you can see that there is a and there is no bone bone 
between it and the middle ear. And it's very, very important to recognize this, if, especially if we are having an operation. So we have patients we have with, with the cholesteatoma, middle ear disease, and we need to do our tympanic membrane perforation. But we need to diagnose that there is one of the, uh, the high jugular bulb because it's risky while doing operation. So back to the first slide, which is the otosclerosis. Um, um, otosclerosis is a medically metabolic disease. It's sometimes called uh, osteospongiosis because it begins with osteospongiotic phase and end up by a uh, uh, sclerotic phase. And the, pro started in the process of otosclerosis usually start are, are in the region on the oval window classically at the what's called the fissula anterior fenestrum or in the anterior part of the oval window um, so on a ct scan detection of autosclerosis can be to for any unexperienced eye but you will find that with clinical uh, clinical uh, so the patients are from conductive hearing loss and you could see that there is a, a a lytic lesion or a lucid, small lucency in front of the oval window. In severe case, this uh, this lucency can be very big surrounding the otic capsule. We call and uh, we call it the fourth ring of uh, Valsalva uh, Val, uh, sorry. So here's the here's a picture. So here's a picture of a, of a patient who had a. Uh, a stabidectomy, you can see that. So here is the uh, inner, here is the inner ear. You can see the otic capsule, and you can see here the vestibule, and this is the oval window. And you see this shiny thing. This is the prosthesis for up to for a stabidectomy operation. So he had already a stabidotomy, and you can see this very tiny translucent area. This is the otosclerotic focus that we diagnose on the CT scan. Sometimes it's very faint line, and it's uh, and but and it's completely occluding over the over again. This is the oval window. This is the inner ear. This is the internal detrimiatus, and this is the stabus foot plate. Okay, and you can see here that this is translucent. So this is really white, and but this is a little bit gray in color. It's translucent. So this lucency or translucent area represent the uh, autosclerotic focus or uh, sometimes obliterative uh, uh, autosclerosis. Even sometimes you can see it over the round window itself, blocking the round window. Ahmed. Uh, yeah. Hello. The, I know uh, you've done a, a lot of work. Thank you for this, uh, but it just we are a bit tight in time. So is, is that okay? I'll give you two minutes. Is that okay? And it's out. I'm nearly there. I'm nearly finished anyway. So the, the next thing, this is the uh, there's the ring around Valsafori, which I said before regarding surrounding ear. Superior canal dehiscence. This is a CT scan, so showing the superior canal dehiscence. You can see that the dehiscence can be related from uh, the superior canal uh, related to the middle cranial fossa. Also, you can see it related to the posterior cranial fossa. And this is another in the in the uh, coronal cuts. You can see that there there is the connection between the our or there is no bone between the uh, superior semicircular circular canal and the dura. Uh, just at the end, uh, this is the pictures of few post-operative finding. If a patient had a mastoidectomy before, another mastoidectomy, a tympanostomy tube or grommets. Uh, this is a patient who had a uh, a, a a uh, conductive hearing loss, and after doing stabidectomy, you can see the prosthesis into the vestibule itself. Uh, and this is the with the incus inter uh, inter, uh, inter uh, positioning. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ahmed, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, next. Uh, you're gonna take uh, two, three minutes uh, rest. Uh, so uh, we would like to thanks first uh, the. Uh, can everyone meet himself? Oh, as well. Um, we would like to thanks uh, the three three D Max, the company that uh, is uh, supporting and uh, uh, 
uh, um, uh, meeting. Uh, we will have a short talk from uh, uh, Adil, representative of the company, for his products, the uh, the Pura Bond, uh, the hemostatic uh, agents for bleeding. Uh, Adil, you can just uh, join if you don't mind. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Ibrahim. Uh, thank you for the uh, the platform in order to uh, introduce the product. Can everybody see my screen? Okay. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, just put it to, to the presentation form. Yeah. Yeah, I will do indeed. Is that okay? Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Well, thank you once again uh, for the uh, the platform in order to uh, present uh, Pure by Mr. Ibrahim. Thank you guys for uh, giving us the opportunity. Um, as Mr. Ibrahim's mentioned, my name's uh, Adil Sharif. I represent a company called uh, 3D Matrix, and we supply a hemostat. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background about the company, um, we come out of uh, MIT, and we're a Japanese-based uh, company. We originally started in um, cardiac and GI, and uh, we've actually kind of, since 2014, we were CE marked, and we've kind of expanded and fallen uh, into ENT, and it's been a really uh, great success. So the question is, what is Pure Bond? So Pure Bond is comprised of uh, four amino acids, and these acids are arginine, alanine, aspartic acid, and alanine. And these acids, uh, peptides, uh, repeat four times in order to make um, RADA-16. Now, the product itself, um, once formed, um, it achieves hemostasis by staying on site for six days. Now, we've actually had data to show that the, some residue may stay longer and it can stay up in the body for approximately 30 days. Now, in this syringe itself, um, it's a pre-filled syringe, so there's no mixing required, there's no preparation. You take it out of the fridge and you can use it straight away. The, the product itself has a pH of two, and when it makes contact with any sort of physiological fluid, um, this changes the pH level to a pH uh, seven, so it neutralizes it, and that achieves hemostasis. Now, Actually, what we found um, from our uh, clinical studies and our trials, and actually you might have maybe come across the uh, the product PureStat, which is also the same product as PureBond, is that we actually found that hemostasis was a secondary outcome, and we were able to show a greater um, wound healing, a reduction of adhesions, and better tissue regeneration. Now, the peptides themselves, as you can see from the uh, images shown in A and B, under a uh, electron microscope, you can see that the uh, the, the the formation of uh, pure bond creates a tighter scaffold, um, which mimics a uh, human cellular excess human cellular matrix, which gives the um, indication um, from our data that it's been able to show um, greater wound healing and greater tissue regeneration. Now the product in the USA. Um, is FDA approved and it's also FDA approved for reducing adhesions, um, wound healing. And this is why in, you know, in the ENT space, it's been used for your fed surgery. It's been used for your um, turbinate reductions. Recently, I've done a few cases for uh, in DCR. Um, in your head and neck cases, it's been used for neck dissections, um, thyroidectomies, spirodectomies. Um, and, you know, and also uh, we've had papers published uh, recently uh, at back home we've just had a journal uh, also accepted for the use of pure bond in uh, uh, adult tonsillectomies and actually what was quite interesting in all three areas was the fact that we were able to also show uh, not not just the fact that we achieved hemostasis but there was a significant reduction in patient pain and for um, adult tonsillectomies, uh, less readmissions, uh, we were all also uh, able to show uh, the same sort of data in our TORS work, um, which I'll go on to a little bit shortly. Um, over the past uh, several months, we've also been actually uh, used, uh, consultants have also been using PureBond in uh, MaxVax and plastics as well. 
Uh, we've had a, a, a bit of data and a few case series regarding um, facelifts and how we were able to show no hematoma for formation or serotoma formation, um, no swelling. So what is the, you know, what is the benefit uh, of the product? What makes this product different to uh, anything else out there? So firstly, it's, it's transparent. It's a hydrogel. So as you're applying the product, you can see exactly where you're applying it and, yet, and you can actually visibly see that you've uh, achieved hemostasis. It's easy to use. So with that being said, there's no preparation that's required. It, you simply take it out of the fridge and it can be used straight away. There's no mixing required. And if you decide, actually, I don't need the product, it can go back in the fridge so it's not wasted. It's completely synthetic. So there's no um, animal derivatives. Um, it doesn't compromise any patients that might have certain religious or ethical beliefs that don't want to use um, certain other products. Um, it mimics a human ex extracellular matrix, which means that the fact that it's amino acids that are broken down by the body, so it's well accepted within the body. And ultimately, it provides hem hemostasis. Now, we were able to show um, through the guys at MIT um, looking at some of this uh, histology data, how actually the structure um, is formed. And you can see from the images from uh, left and the right that actually um, due to the uh, the hydrogel, we were able to show that the, uh, the nanofibers are much stronger uh, and the bonds are much uh, greater in order to show enhanced healing. Transparency, um, this is a few images from a uh, turbinoplasty. Uh, tonsillectomy and another turbinoplasty. You can see the fact that I always mention, you know, you can't treat what you can't see. And because the product um, is transparent, it gives you a, a lot more control and it's very easy um, to apply. It's also a, a non-swelling product. And actually, uh, a lot of my consultants across the country have also been using uh, Purebond for some of their skull-based surgery or some of their orbital work because it doesn't add any pressure. And just like some of the presentations I've been listening to earlier on, it doesn't compromise if it's going to be used anywhere near the facial nerve or any other uh, surrounding areas. I've gone through this, so I'll skip this. I'll see if this video plays. So this was a gives you a little bit of an insight on how the products actually uh, applied during sinus surgery. And this was done from the guys, uh, Dr. Ananda in Adelaide. So I'll let this play. And in order to have the correct application of when you're using Purebond, like I said, in Fez surgery, it's approved for redu reducing adhesions. Uh, when you apply the job, you just want to apply a thin layer. And the best application and what we've learned from our experience is actually to go back in with the freer and spread it like you're painting a fence. Just coat it nice and thinly because less is more. And that's far more um, beneficial. This saves, you know, nasal packing. It saves if there's no uh, there's no excess that you need to suck out or be concerned about. So it gives you a little bit more of a, uh, reassurance, and you can see from the image, um, the post op. This is the product that's been used in a thyroidectomy, and this was a um, uh, same product, uh, Purest, as I mentioned before, which was conducted in France. You can see that it's very easy to apply. It doesn't flood the area. And actually, because it's a hydrogel, it actually seeps into some of the nooks and crannies that you won't be able to potentially get into. And it doesn't foam, it doesn't, um, because it's a, it's a non-swelling product. So there's no sort of um, reaction. As you see, see quite clearly from the images. Now, this is some of the uh, case reports and some of the data that we recently um, come out with. And you can see, I won't go into in much detail, my details are uh, at the end of this presentation, but you can see from sinus surgery, endoscopic sinus surgery, we, I always get the uh, the feedback that adhesions are a, are a concern, nasal packing is, is a concern, the patient discomfort is a, is a concern. And actually throughout our journey with Pure Bond in ENT, we've been able to show common themes of no post-operative bleeding, severe reduction in adhesions or no adhesions, uh, absence of uh, um, um, a bleeding we achieved hemostasis. Um, you can see from some of the other data that we recently uh, produced as well, and this is from uh, our most recent recent data uh, for the use of pure bonding tools, 
Um, this was conducted from the guys uh, in Birmingham. And because the product uh, is a hydrogel and it stays on site, it gives the, the comfortability, the fact that actually there's no concern for the product to aspirate down to the lungs or cause any contra uh, complications. We were able to show from the use of Pure One actually um, the reduced length of stay of the patients um, uh, in the hospital. But more importantly, actually, what was uh, quite um, uh, enlightening to hear was that the patient, uh, using the patient pain severity score uh, system, that their pain was significantly reduced or no pain whatsoever, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, always a concern um, for the patients, especially when you're removing large uh, tumours or large, uh, you know, leaving a larger uh, raw surface area. So applying this onto the mucosa, applying this onto the actual um, bed um, acts as a, a great barrier in order to uh, help uh, reduce pain, but also promote healing. And this is just a, a case series that we had from a, a consultant in uh, Chicago, Illinois, for Julius View who used uh, Pyrobond um, on uh, 15 patients uh, following uh, facelift surgery. And actually what they found was uh, this uh, expedited the healing process, but also um, showed no post-operative uh, bruising and uh, hematoma formation. And you can see the, 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 uh, the pictures um, below, uh, figure uh, 3A, 3B and 3C, um, actually how much less uh, swelling and uh, bruising, if any. Thank you very much for my for your time today. Um, my details are, are below and my email address is asharif at purematrix.com. This is available on the NHS and uh, you know, I'd be great to hear your thoughts and if there's any questions, I'd like to uh, do my best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just uh, how long would it take for the material to degrade? Yeah, so it takes roughly uh, about 15 seconds to uh, react uh, in order for hemostasis to be achieved. And it stays within the body um, for uh, um, uh, 30 days. So what happened if I'm after finishing and applying the material that I saw a spot which I don't like, I want to go back to it. Can I remove it? You can indeed. You can indeed. Not traumatic to be let off or something like that. Sorry, I can't hear you. It's traumatic to be let off. No, because it's a because it's a a hydrogel. Um, it's uh, it doesn't cause any uh, any pain, and we've not had that feedback thus far. In um, we've had this in in, in tonsillectomies where they're using it at the moment routinely for uh, pain it's pain itself, where they're just applying a thin layer, so it hasn't caused any uh, complications. Thanks, Dad. Uh, there's, uh, without, uh, I don't, I don't want to use the uh, the product itself uh, for uh, bleeding with my team. Uh, Shadi and H as well in the bilateral uh, SPA ligation. I thought that you're gonna present it as well. Yeah, uh, I, we, I couldn't get the we video. Did, yeah, we we just we applied the the after the ligation of the the artery. Um, just a very thin layer of a derma wound and we followed up the patient and it was amazing to be honest if there wasn't any bleeding patient went home easily without any problems so thank you for this we are i know that we are 25 um, uh, minutes uh, passing the our time so the next presentation will be uh, my colleague ahmed uh, biyumi so ahmed just uh, me sure yeah so can you mute, you mute yourself um, Adam? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mnamer, academic leader of the United Nations Hospitals, and Mr. Brahim as well. 
Uh, I'm uh, uh, Ahmad Bayoumi, one of the ENT specialist doctor here in the hospital. Uh, I'm so delighted to be one of the presenters today. I'm going to talk very quickly to Mr. Brahim uh, about subrahoid mixed spaces. Um, uh, our goals or learning points we are going to have today is based on uh, to identify the landmarks, uh, to be able to identify the correct anatomical uh, spaces and uh, location. Hence, we can identify the lesion easily. Uh, uh, basically, we need to we need to uh, identify first of all the hyoid bone. Uh, the hyoid is uh, you can see in the sagittal uh, uh, plane here in the CT scan. It's at the root of the tongue, uh, and in the axial cut, it is uh, like horseshoe shape uh, bone. Uh, Suprahyoid neck spaces. Actually, there's two types of spaces. One of them are confined confined one, which is uh, um, just only suprahyoid, like sublingual, submandibular, buccal, masticator, and the parapharyngeal joint, which is continuing downward below the level of the hyoid bone, like retropharyngeal, carotid space, dangerous space, revertebral space. Actually, my friend, Mr. Suleiman, will go in a bit more with some of them. Uh, to understand the next spaces, we need to know, first of all, how it works with the fascia underneath the skin. There is, you know, superficial fascia, which is enclosing or galvic platysma muscle, and there is deep fascia. With, there is three layers. Actually, the first one, which is investing fascia, is uh, getting through the trapezius, sternomastoid, submandibular, sublingual gland. Uh, uh, middle fascia is a visceral fascia, and back behind the prevertebral and alar fascia. Here, just uh, uh, this section showing most of the suprahyoid neck spaces, including number uh, one, the baropharyngeal space, number two, uh, masticatory space, number uh, four is barotid space, three, carotid, uh, five, uh, pharyngeal mucosa space, and six, which is retropharyngeal space. We will start with masticatory space, uh, this one, which is uh, um, formed by the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia, which is called investing fascia, including masseter, medial trogoid, lateral trogoid, and temporalis muscle. Masticatory space content, as we previously mentioned, we can see here in terms of the coronal section of the CT scan, uh, the masseter muscle, which is the most lateral one over here, and medially at the level of the nasopharynx, the lateral, uh, lateral trogoid, and just below the medial trogoid. This is a very nice section showing the foramen oval where the medial uh, mandibular nerve running down. And in the other, in the right-hand side, uh, cuts, we can see this axial cut showing at the level of the nasopharynx, which it's very important to identify the medial compartment of this space. Here we can say this is the lateral trigoid, and this is a masseter muscle. And if we're going a bit through down to the level, the oropharynx, this will be the medial trigoid and laterally will be the masseter muscle as well. For clinical correlation here, this is a summary of example of masticator uh, spaces infection started with his form ontogenic origin uh, infection, uh, developing space over here and ring enhancement in, uh, ended by an abscess formation. This is a, a pony lesion, sunburst uh, appearance, which is osteosarcoma, the most common uh, uh, bony cancerous lesion. Baropharyngeal space, as we all know about this space, is extended from the skull base down to the hyoid bone, uh, medially baccopharyngeal fascia, which or this fascia and medial trigoid muscle. Content of the this space is very important clinically. There is pre-styloid and post-styloid uh, content. The post-styloid, which is the third styloid process, uh, uh, including the internal jugular vein, as well as uh, from nine to uh, twelve cranial nerves. The most common uh, clinical clinically. Uh, uh, problems in the pre space where the, we can find the barotid gland, including uh, 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 retromandibular vein and external carotid artery. Here is we can find the space uh, just lateral to the nasopharynx, as well as this part also. This is an MRI scan coronal section and CT scan uh, axial cut over here. 
clinical correlation here, we can find a uh, salivary grand tumor, most likely bilumorphic adenoma. Here is a steer scan. We have to stress on this point when we're requesting the scan in baratharyngeal space to get it steer as a fat suppression uh, cuts to be able to suppress the fat, and then hence we can be able to see any lesion there. This is with T1 enhanced, and this is T1 without uh, contrast. As you see, it's high bone tensing. Uh, Barofringia mucosal spirit, it's this, the name, the expression itself is not common to our ears, but actually this is one of uh, the origin of the, one of the most common abscesses we encounter in our uh, uh, clinical practice, uh, especially the pre to cellular abscess, which extending uh, from the base of skull up to the hyoid bone. I'm speaking, I'm talking about the pharyngeal mucosal space, uh, medially the pharyngeal mucosa and laterally the uh, pharyngeal muscles. Here, uh, as we see here, uh, the ring enhancement of abscess collection in very tonsillar space pushing the tonsil inward. Also, this is an MRI scan showing uh, uh, a lesion here in the fossa of Rosenmuller, most likely as a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and pushing the torus tuberous down, closing the station tube. Parotitis space, again, this is section again, which is number four, just behind uh, the uh, mandible. Uh, it's content, as we see here, as in the, uh, uh, discussed before, in terms of the pre styloid uh, content of the uh, baropharyngeal space, uh, parotid gland, facial nerve, uh, retromandibular nerve. And this cut is very important to show this is a mandible and this is parotid gland, and we can easily see the mandibular nerve running here and external carotid artery. And on the other hand, is uh, the facial nerve just underneath the uh, retromandibular nerve. And this clinic or surgically, it's a very important point we have to look after. Clinically, uh, we can see here on the right side, heterogeneous lesion in this axial cut of MRI scan on the left, uh, which is without contrast, and here with a contrast show hyper intense heterogeneity uh, on this parotid, most likely mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Obviously, this will be completed with ultrasound scan core biopsy. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about today is a sublingual submandibular gland, which is essentially we need to know the landmark where to start to look for this point here, this is what's called the median ref, uh, a space in the floor of the mouth. On either side, we can we can say this is the genoglossus muscle, which is responsible for protruding the tongue out. Laterally, very close to the mandible, uh, the mylohyoid muscle, and the posteriorly the hyoglossus. So to be able to uh, differentiate between the tongue uh, as a as as an organ and the floor of mouth, we have to identify this ref. Then, hence, we can go through everything around. And in a bit low below cut here, showing submandibular gland started to appear, which is clinically very important when we looking for a parenchyal cyst. For example, we'll be, we will see a cyst between the uh, anterior border of sternomastoid and the. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ahmed, uh, for the nice presentation. And amazing, to be honest, short in the uh, waiting time. <laughs> so next week, what we have is uh, uh, this is Suleiman. Uh, just let me prepare the presentation. Uh, is mine as well. This is the last one I've One second, this is what I said yesterday. Before you said that, this is the last one. Yeah.
So, uh, is everyone can see the presentation? No. Sorry? And the front camera. Oh, is it me? Uh, just stop showing. So what's happening? No, what's happening? Should. <laughs> is it okay now? So why when I do this? Yeah. And now can you see it? Yes. Okay. That's fine. Uh, thank you, Sh Shadi. Um, can you see the other one? It's going to be the same. Uh, the right to the phone. Maybe this is It's not here. It's a viewing. This one, yeah. Yeah, OK. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, interest at attending our radiology course. I would like to thank Mr. Ibrahim for this opportunity, and Mr. Ben Amir, our uh, educational lead. Uh, I will uh, speak in uh, this presentation, uh, CT scan, normal anatomy in the infrahyoid spaces. So uh, to make it quicker, So uh, as uh, Mr. Bayoumi uh, mentioned that uh, the hyoid bone is U-shaped bone. So uh, all the space I will discuss now is, uh, is below the hyoid bone. So we can see it in the uh, in the uh, in the sagittal view, the level of the hyoid bone. So uh, I will talk first about the uh, pharyngeal and mucosal uh, spaces, then the infrahyoid space is a visceral space, then the common spaces in both uh, infra and suprahyoid. Uh, first one will speak up in the uh, pharyngeal and laryngeal mucosal space. So in the sagittal view, we can see the nasopharyngeal extent from the skull base to the level of the soft palate. From uh, soft palate to the level of the hyoid bone, you can see the uh, oropharynx. From the level of the hyoid bone to the cricoid is the hypopharynx. In front of the hypopharynx, we can see the uh, laryngeal uh, mucosal space, which is divided to supraglottic and glottic and subglottic space. So, in the, the sagittal view, in the mid -sagitt, uh, sagittal view, uh, CT scan, we can see the airway, uh, the epiglottis. If we go to the uh, bara uh, sagittal view, we can see the opacity of uh, this vertical opacity, which indicate to the vocal cord. Lateral to it, we can see that this depth was indicated to the bilateral fossa, which is part of the hypopharynx. Uh, so uh, this is first the uh, first cut of the high level of the hypopharynx, so which can see this is level in this axial cut. We can see the uh, mandible and the upper limit of the hyoid bone here, the supraglottic space, and infra. Uh, and this is uh, the. Uh, Epiglottis. In front of the epiglottis, you can see this uh, both cavity, which is uh, indicated to the follicular, 
and divided by the uh, epiglottic fold. Now we'll go to the uh, lower part of the hypo, uh, hypopharynx, which is uh, uh, this level in the anatomy view. We can see this is the upper limit of the thyroid cartilage, and this is uh, the uh, supraglottic space. Be medial to the uh, thyroid cartilage, we can see this epiglottic fold, and uh, here we can see the aryepiglottic fold. Lateral to it, medial to the thyroid cartilage, we can see this uh, cavities indicate to the both pyriform fossa, which part from the uh, hypopharynx. Now we'll, I will speak uh, 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 in the laryngeal mucosal space, the superior uh, level is sobraglottic. So in the axial cut, this is in the anatomical view level of the false vocal fold. In the axial cut of CT, you can see here the uh, thyroid cartilage, and uh, this is the space of supraglottic space. Lateral to it, you can see the false vocal fold, and uh, this is still your colomastoid muscle, and this is the major uh, neck uh, vessels. Uh, below it, we can see the glottic space, uh, uh, the glottic space, and uh, uh, this is the thyroid cartilage, and this is the true focal fold. We can see, and this is the posterior end of the true focal cord. We can see the arytenoid uh, cartilage. Now, I, I would like to, to highlight, highlight for this is a very uh, important uh, 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 anatomical uh, landmarks. Uh, it's uh, the laryngeal uh, ventricle, which is located between the false vocal cord and the true vocal cord, which um, can sometimes head uh, uh, the tumor can be hide it in, in this uh, area. So we can see it in the uh, so, so in the coronal uh, CT cuts. This is the true vocal cord, and this is the false vocal cord, and this is the dips is the uh, laryngeal ventricle. Now we'll go for the uh, lower part of the uh, larynx, which is uh, the uh, subglottic. In the subglutic, we can see the, uh, this, uh, the uh, cricoid cartilage, and we can see this is the superior part of the thyroid. can start to see the thyroid in this cut, the circulomastoid. This is the internal uh, jugular vein, and uh, this is a common carotid artery. Now I will speak uh, in the uh, specific space uh, located in the infrahyoid. Uh, next space is the visceral. As Mr. Bayumi mentioned, that we have deep and superficial uh, cervical fascia. The uh, deep uh, fascia is uh, divided to three uh, layers. The first uh, uh, layer is uh, the investing layer, which envelops the uh, strap muscle, steliculomastoid, and the trapezius. The uh, visceral fascia is enveloped the pharynx, larynx, and trachea esophagus, as well as the thyroid and parathyroid. And the posterior one is the perivertebral fascia, which envelops the prevertebral muscle, paraspinal muscle, as well as the vertebral body. Between the uh, visceral and the prevertebral uh, fascia, there is uh, three important uh, spaces. It's the retropharyngeal space. Behind, then, uh, behind it, we can see the dangerous space divided from the retropharyngeal by the alar fascia between the dangerous space and the prevertebral, and you can see behind it, you can see the prevertebral space uh, located between the prevertebral fascia and the body of the uh, vertebra. And uh, between the three fascia, we can see this is the, uh, the carotid, uh, carotid space which is located between these uh, three fascia. So uh, we'll go for the lower level, level of the trachea. This is, we can see in the uh, coronal cut. This is the level of the uh, cricoid. So in this cut, we can see the airway. Uh, can see the airway is the trachea. Let us it can see the right and the left thyroid loop, circulomastoid. This is uh, internal jugular vein and the uh, common carotid artery. Uh, in this uh, cut, we go lower. Uh, you can see the thyroid cartilage level of the thyroid isthmus, and we can see here the um, level five of the uh, cervical lymph node. So, uh, if we go lower to, to it, we can see the thyroid cartilage. Isth uh, th sorry, the thyroid uh, gland the, and the isthmus. We can see the anterior and medial sacralis muscle. If we go lower to the chest inlet, in this cut, we can see the major um, uh, 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 vessels. So this is uh, subclavial uh, vein. In the right side, we can see the anterior, uh, uh, the right common carotid artery, and behind we can see the right subclavial vein. Now uh, there is four uh, spaces 
uh, extends from the uh, in both uh, supra hyoid and infra hyoid space. First one is the uh, carotid space, which is uh, uh, extends from the skull base to the uh, our uh, to the um, aortic arch. So. Uh, in the level of the suprahyoid space, the um, uh, suprahyoid uh, carotid space is contained the internal carotid artery, internal jugular vein, cranial nerve from 9th to 12th. However, the uh, ansa cervicalis is anterior to this space and, uh, uh, and uh, sympathetic trunk is posterior. So in this uh, uh, XCT axial cut level of the nasopharynx, you can see this is the symptom. So this is the tip of the mastoid. This is the uh, celloid uh, process. Here we can see the, um, uh, the uh, internal jugular vein and here the internal carotid artery. Infrahyoid carotid space. And this is level of the hyoid bone. So in this level, the carotid space contains only the common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein, as well as uh, uh, vagus nerve. So in this axial cut level of the uh, hyoid bone, see we, we can see here the uh, submandibular gland. Behind it, you can see sericulomastoid. This is the uh, internal jugular vein, and here's the common carotid artery. This is a uh, level of um, thyroid cartilage. As we can see, this is a thyroid gland, and this is the internal jugular vein at medial to it between the uh, lateral to the thyroid uh, loop. We can see the common carotid artery. Uh, just I put this one of the pathology in the carotid space, which is the carotid body tumor. How you can see this pathology can uh, uh, increase the space between the antenna and jugular vein, which gives on the uh, on the CT angio uh, lia uh, sign. Uh, now uh, speak with uh, uh, three uh, spaces. All these spaces uh, extend from the skull base. However, the uh, is different from each other from the lower level. Uh, the lower wing extends the lower levels. For the retropharyngeal space extends from the skull base and in, in the level of the carina T4, which is located behind uh, the uh, the mucosal uh, or uh, mucosal space or the uh, visceral space. So in this uh, cut of uh, so, suprahyoid space, we can see this is the pharyngeal uh, space. Behind it, you can see the retropharyngeal uh, retro space, and this is the prevertebral space. This is uh, the level of the uh, between the uh, nasopharynx and the oropharynx. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, level of um, the axial cut level of the hyoid bone. Here you can see the hyoid bone, this is the ground, and uh, this is the uh, impression of the uh, retropharyngeal space. And uh, so I, uh, this is the um, uh, Sagittal cut and this uh, sagittal just to see how it is thin. This uh, retropharyngeal space level of C2 is uh, less than seven millimeter. If uh, in the uh, C6 is uh, less than uh, 21 millimeter, and this uh, axial cut level of the uh, 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 hyoid bone, we can see uh, this is the areobiglotic fold, and here we can see the uh, impression of the retropharyngeal space. Uh, this is a normal uh, cut, such uh, a cut, uh, so very thin retropharyngeal spaces. We can see how it's widening this space uh, with a central necrosis and ring enhancement, which is indicated to retropharyngeal abscess. So dangerous space is, uh, extends from the skull base and uh, the lower leaf is the diaphragm. And this uh, located behind the retropharyngeal space, separated from the alar fascia and anterior to the vertebral space. Uh, so this is a uh, uh, axial cut. We can see this is a visceral space, and this thin layer is the um, uh, reef, uh, the retropharyngeal. Behind you can see the dangerous space. This is a uh, um, uh, surgical cut for retropharyngeal abscess, and we can see how extend to the uh, chest via the dangerous space. And this is the uh, surgical cut in the level of the chest. We can see how this is uh, this is abscess in a uh, level of the uh, dangerous space. Now we, uh, the last space, uh, so a brief vertebral space which extends from skull base the cossacks. Uh, so it has two compartments, brief vertebral and paraspinal. So uh, this is a little of uh, the suprahyoid. We can see it's located anterior to the vertebral body and the level of the infrahyoid you can see is the impression of uh, the uh, brief vertebral space. And here the yellow one is the retropharyngeal space, suprahyoid and infrahyoid. And between, you can see the dangerous space. And you can see lateral to uh, all of them, you can see the carotid space. 
Uh, last thing, just uh, to uh, give you this um, uh, view about the retropharyngeal space, how it's a two compartment, three vertebral compartment, and uh, uh, posterior compartment, which is the paraspinal compartment. And thank you. Thanks, Shadi. This is the, was amazing, short and nice. Uh, so let's uh, go for the next presentation. We have uh, Professor Zahote, uh, Turby University Hospital. Um, let me set up your presentation for you first. We have to give so so you. Don't have any more. Uh, so you have uh, like half an hour. It's okay. okay. Yes, it, 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 you can. We are now reaching the, the a good time. Try not to over talk. Get in download. Get in download. Which one is yours? Uh, that's on the bottom. Oh, yeah, no problem, yeah. Mm. Is this is if you can press my things. Hey, by Excel. So. Can you see it in the water? Is it on? Is it on chair? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is no risk. Um, this is your. Yeah, no risk. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, we're all good. Yeah, no, you all. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bindi Saito, one of the consultant and neck surgeons, robotic surgeons and paediatric and neck surgeons from UHDB. And I'm the head of service and the NIHR lead for head and neck cancer in the entire East Midlands. Um, I'm just going to talk about some cross-sectional imaging in regards to primarily MRI as a modality. Ahmed and Shadi have already done an excellent job of covering a lot of things that I've already going to talk about. And so there's going to be a bit of repetition. But what I'm going to try and do is try and give you a kind of a good nomenclature to think about these things. I've split it up into two sides of a lecture. You don't need the first side because most of it's been covered. So let's kind of rattle through what we can. So generally, what are the spaces that interest the head and neck surgeon overall? Well, the bits that we're interested in from a surgical point of view are the base of skull, where the cranial nerves lie at the back, the temporal bone, the optic canal and the involvement of the optic complex as a whole, the sinus nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the suprahyoid neck versus the infrahyoid neck as your primary issues overall in regards to different organisational structures. And this dictates what you need to think about from a surgical management point of view, what you actually need to do. Well, a lot of this is defined by the layers which traverse and cross and associate and pack the neck into the organisational structures that we lie in. And this, is, this melds on to the actual pathologies that we get. What I'm going to do is discuss the anatomy and identify some of the spaces and regions. So if you split the actual cancers themselves up as a organisational structure, these are the kind of main eight areas that we get squamous cell carcinomas primarily in the head and neck, so the nasopharyngeal cavity, um, the nasopharynx for um, NPCCs, the oral cavity for HPV 16 positive, the oral pharynx more importantly for that, for the unknown primary, the larynx itself, which I won't talk about much because primarily as a modality, MRI is not the modality to use for assessment of the larynx. Um, the hyperpharynx, the esophagus and the trachea. So I am going to jump through a whole heap of slides of 3D anatomy because lots of this has actually been covered overall. And this is a lecture that I give to medical students all the way up to registrars getting ready for their exams. 
where we talk about the 3D and cross-sectional anatomy of the neck. And we layer out the platysma, as in Elizabethan collar, put the trapezius in and the SCM, and then we kind of draw a Pringles man. And then I draw you an edging of where the deep cervical investing fascia lies in the neck, where it wraps around the trapezius and the anterior and posterior border, wraps around um, to the front over the SCM, divides around the SCM, the front and the back, and then goes under the platysma. And that acts as your Elizabethan column to hold everything and pack it in the neck overall. Then the pretracheal fascia, which Shadi's already um, mentioned when we were talking about the infrahyoid neck. And then we talk about the contents with the trachea, the esophagus, thyroid, and a few lymphatic things that you can get there as a whole. Pretracheal fascia being a elongation and a carotid fascia laterally on both sides with the left and right carotid um, and surrounding structures. And that, this will come up again in a minute. When we talk about the chromid common carotid, the IJV, the vagus, and the deep cervical nerves there. And this is paramount when you're looking at neck dissections. Then there's the prevertebral fascia. And I, I, this is how I think of most of the neck with some additional spaces. So especially for the infrahyoid neck, this is an excellent way of thinking about what is where. And it guides you in regards to surgical access, surgical process, and also about what pathologies affect where and where they can go to most importantly. Um, Realistically, prevertebral fascia, you don't need to know much about it apart from it exists in the coli muscles. And this is how you apply the Pringles procedure across to cross section on the imaging as a whole. And I do find it generally works in a really simplified but organised fashion. Um, and I won't go through this too much. And I'm going to get us over onto the hyoid bone, which again has just been mentioned because we've done infra and superhyoid over um, um, from that point of view. Realistically, from the hyoid muscles point of view, you have four muscles above the hyoid, four below the mark. Hyoid, and they elevate and depress the hyoid in swallowing and speech primarily. Two muscles that are paramount to head and neck surgery are the digastric and the omohyoid from a surgical point of view in regards to the anatomical considerations they are for access, disease process and surgical considerations overall. So the hyoid primarily splits into two kind of uh, separate bits. So the superhyoid are all these muscles that are above here, the infrahyoid are all the ones down here, which are primarily the three sets of straps and your omohyoid here. I'm going to kind of ignore all the other um, straps, but your superhyoid, your digastric goes from your mastoid process, comes as a two form like the bicep down to the hyoid, goes and joins there and then makes a tendinous band and then comes up to inside just underneath the jaw, right under the mention as a whole. And that's a defining definer um, to separate between level 1A, 1B and 2 primarily. And the omohyoid comes basically from your scapula across a, a thick fusion band again but this lies under the SCM and then it then tilts up and angles up to join the infra aspect of the hyoid itself and this is your anatomical landmark to differentiate between level three and level four lower down. These are just the triangles overall and how they look like and I'm going to kind of jump through these bits because they link down. So we're going to talk about levels in the neck overall and we've very briefly spoken about one A 1B and 2 and 2B, level 3, level 4 coming down through your anterior chain, level 5 which is split anatomically in relation to the accessory nerve and anatomically 2B and 2A are split via the accessory nerve and it'll come to my next slide where I'll explain this all. Then you've got the actual larynx itself, 6 sitting in the protracheal fascia and 7 sitting behind um, the actual back of the sternum. The original classification was due to Jack and Shah's pivotal work on his original PhD on levels of the neck. And what they did at the Memorial Sloan Kettering was they reviewed a load of different cancers from uh, basically modified and radical uh, neck dissections, went through the pathology and then identified which areas were affected by which type of cancer. And this um, kind of dictated a lot of that. These are kind of the other variations. And one of the things just to be really wary about in regards to levels of the neck is there are two distinct differences between radiological levels and anatomical levels. Radiologists are limited by things they can physically see on the actual scan. Now, this primarily means that the landmarks that they use are muscular, cartilaginous or bony. And therefore, you don't use the access to nerves, which you do surgically, because they can't really see the accessory nerve in any way, shape or form on their imaging. And this is one of the kind of things that people get really uh, confused about. But actually, it's really quite straightforward. Now, this slide pretty much sums it all up in one kind of split. And this is the way I kind of think about it. So your level one goes from your mandible, posterior um, margin, your submandibular gland, 
is the back boundary of level one. Level 1A is the midline, and that goes to the anterior belly of your digastric. Level 1B sits in the kissing zone between your two hands and your digastric. Once you come to the back of the submandibular gland, it has a little nubbin that often wraps around the back of the mandible and then a little bit that pushes out on towards two. Level 2 is basically where we're going to predominantly spend most of our time talking about shortly, which is where it goes from the skull base and it drops down towards the hyoid bone. Anatomically, two is split differently than it is surgically. So surgically, we use the accessory nerve. So what lies anterior to the accessory nerve is 2A. And so that's how you remember it. Two anterior, 2A. What lies behind the accessory nerve is two behind or 2B. Whereas the overall difference in regards to that is the hyoid is primarily what is used radiologically for this differentiator as a whole. In regards to level three, we again use another mu uh, muscle versus a anatomical marker. So the LMR hyoid doesn't often project very well in the MRI scans. It's quite hard to track because it angles in two different orientations. So it's very hard to chase it up. And therefore, um, often radiologically, um, people use the cricoid cartilage because you have a cartilaginous slash calcified bit of cartilage, which gives you a more defined landmark. Whereas actually, if you surgically were doing a supra homohyoid neck dissection at level one, two, three, you go down to the homohyoid and you clear everything above the homohyoid and you would not actually go down as low as the cricoid itself. Level four, like I said, goes down to the bottom of the uh, clavicle. Level five, again, is the split between the muscle, which is the homohyoid versus the nerve of the accessory nerve. And in this scenario, in 5A and B, the difference is 5A is five above the accessory nerve and 5B is below the accessory nerve. So in level two, it's anterior and behind, and level five is above and below. And that, that's what I find is the easiest way of thinking of surgical landmarks in regards to this. Your level six is basically all your pre-pandal um, thyroid space sitting between your crotids and sitting above the sternal notch. And that is the classical definition of the level six. And level seven is where the continuation of the neck goes into the back of the thorax and where you sit behind the actual sternum itself. Oh, that's 10 minutes. That's pretty uh, rapid. Um, <laughs> slam through a lot of anatomy um, to people who understand lots. Yeah. So, yes, a significant number of distinguished fellows. And um, let's talk about the pharyngeal space, because that's what most of this talk is now about. Now, it's when we look at the radiological aspects of MRI scans. Now, we've already kind of spoken about this, and I'm sure this has been mentioned several times over the day, of the characteristics of MRI and how they are in relation to CT. And the CT obviously is very good for things like the temporal bone and the assessment of the larynx, whereas it's a very relatively poor comparative to MRI. A CT scan is not a bad way of looking at the neck, but it's nowhere near as good as an MRI scan. That's the way I kind of look at it. And if you look at all the current classification and systems and recommendations from the JLA for cancer guidance, the primary modality should be an MRI of the neck and the assessment of head neck cancer, um, predominantly with the exception of larynx or bony invasion in regards to oral cavity. Um, whereas in those scenarios, I normally just do both scans because you can't really get it wrong that way. So the parapharyngeal space, as we've already said, is an upside iron pyramid. It goes from your skull base, dips down to your hyoid, has close approximation with your submandibular gland, and the submandibular space has good approximation with a parapharyngeal space and where infections can lie in regards to tonsillitis. And we'll talk about that in a second. And this is a cross section of it just showing you how they're laid out in this kind of Y format. Now, the parapharyngeal space anatomy here is a, another cut that we've got as a whole with a coronal. And this shows you how, where it's sitting in this kind of yellow inverted pyramid. Now, I always think when you look at it radiologically, it never quite looks like a pyramid. I always think it looks like a lost bit of spaghetti, which is a bit fat at the bottom. Um, and it's just because the angulation of where this space, which we'll talk about in a second, pushes out and indents on it. So sometimes don't get confused if the space thins up as you come up and then fattens up again when you're getting up towards the top as a whole. Now, this goes from your skull base down to your hyoid. It predominantly contains fat. And like I said, already connects with the submandibular gland and classically described as an inverted pyramid. And there are ways that people split up um, this in regards to pre styloid space and post styloid space. And this is the easiest way of thinking about this is pre styloid overall. And then we will split this up a little bit further. So the paraphrangeal spat, fat and the paraphrangeal space, and I'll often use those terms a bit interchangeably, are really good anatomical markers of telling you where pathology is coming from. And the reason is, is this paraphrangeal um, fat helps identify where things are coming from 
because it will move in certain orientations on certain types of images. And these are kind of some of the actual examples that we go through. And we'll talk about how the parapharyngeal fat itself overall moves and then gets pushed, pushed across in different directions. And these are kind of the things that can move it across. And that's predominantly what the rest of this talk is about. So when you look at the uh, sorry, the pharyngeal mucosa, this is an area of anywhere of the lining which is in connection with the back of the nose, the back of the actual throat itself, and as you come down from the skull base all the way down to the thyroid, thyroid uh, sorry, to the um, thyroid. And this is where you can get mucosal lesions which can arise superiorly it butts onto the sphenoid, the clivus, um, the foramen and lat lacerum can get up to your carotid. And this is a tracking way that you can get through the skull base and end up potentially into the area of the cavernous sinus. Now, this is where it's laid out on the right in this kind of yellow spectrum. If you have a mucosal lesion, it often will push the parapharyngeal fat both laterally and posteriorly. And this is if it's arising from the mucosal surface. And you can see here on this kind of circle gobule that that is exactly what this is doing. And they will push the fat away. And the giveaways here are what you do is you look at basically certain types of imaging of where the contrast is in regards to the vessels. You compare the vessels on one side to the other side and you look for the orientation and the movement of those. And that is really quite important when we come to the next few cases. Now, this should now explain to you why um, collections in and around the tonsils can easily move to the parapharyngeal space from a peritonsal abscess and go down and track downwards because the mucosa is basically medial to that area overall. So here are kind of three different types of images I'm going to show you in a second, where you get a variation between tonsillitis, peritonsal erythema, localised collection inside the tonsil versus a full known uh, parapharyngeal bordering quinsy. And there's that combination of knowing where one becomes the other because there really isn't much differentiation. And if you scan them, you can often end up finding that they'll get overcalled into parapharyngeal space collections. So if you look at these imaging on the left, you can see the streaking of fat, which is highly suggestive. And this is often used by radiologists when they look at the neck in regards to fat stranding and streaking that you can get from inflammatory processes as a whole. And this is often used for the assessment of cancers. And you'll often be sat in the MDT and you'll hear these words. And that's what they're talking about, where you get these kind of different kind of um, units that you can see over here, where some of them are white or some are darker and so on. Then this here is an image of a abscess with inside the tonsil itself. This isn't a peritonsil abscess, this is an abscess in the tonsil. And you can see what's happening with the parapharyngeal space, that it's then starting to get pushed back and you can see the difference in echogenicity between the outside and the inside. This is a peritonsal abscess, and you can see where it's tracking laterally and going around. And you can see why this such a easy, it's such easy to convert a peritonsal abscess to a pharyngeal space infection. So here's an example of a nasopharyngeal carcinoma sitting at the back of the nose and expanding backwards. Here it's rising from mucosal surface, and it's pushing back and pushing that parapharyngeal space backwards and laterally. And that's often what they do. And in regards to this, the T1 images are better for this because you're looking at an air interface rather than a water interface, whereas the T2 would be better. And we'll talk about it when we're talking about PSAs in a minute, especially if they've got fluid components. And these are kind of the things that you'd look at. So that is the first thing we're going to talk about, movement wise. Next, let's talk about the masticator space. So Shadi, um, uh, or sorry, Ahmed actually brought this up um, when we were talking about it earlier. And these are images from the University of Utah from a chap called Richard Wiggins, who gives some amazing talks on this as a whole. And um, he has a great library collection where he's actually mapped a lot of these out. Now, here the masticator space from the ENT surgeon. We often dodge this space because we often see it as the remit of the MaxFact surgeon. But there are times you do need to think about pathology that happens here because they will sometimes rock up in an ENT clinic. So your masticator space is basically everything aligned with the chewing overall, and hence why we often just market off to the max fact surgeons so it lies basically superficial to the cervical fascia it contains the mandible the master branch of trigeminal nerve and it lies anterior and lateral to the parapharyngeal fat so there's two components there's a superior component and an inferior component so these are sometimes differentiated by the area that goes to the temporalis which lives above the zygoma i.e the suprazygomatic bit or the bit that lives underneath the zygoma, the infrazygomatic, 
aspect. So most of the work is down here, but you do get this temporal extension, and this is obviously the temporal fascia for if you're doing some panoplasty or megaplasty as your potential graft site. So this area is often seen by ENT surgeons, whereas this doesn't seem to be because the majority of us won't ever do anything with the joint itself. So here's a masticated space when you're looking at it on an eight seal cut and you can see where you lie in relation to the carotid itself and the parapharyngeal fat overall that's sitting there. And this is it laid out but with a yellow marker. So if you have a mass in the parapharyngeal space, what it'll do is it'll push this way and that way overall, and then it will push that medial and posterior. It doesn't tend to go anterior because if it goes anterior, it'll bulge this way. So it tends to push it that way. So the movement of the fat is in the opposite direction of where the mass normally aligns for, because the mass will get bigger and it will expand away from where it's originating from. And that's often the giveaway with parapharyngeal fat as your dictator of where things are arising or going to. So one of the things that we should be aware of in the uh, masticated space because you've got V3 sat there, you have to be wary of pathologies which aggressively are perineural spread. So things like adenoid cystic are one of the things that you need to be really aware of in this zone um, because they've got high avidity to jumping onto nerves and then tracking up nerves and even skipping up nerves, even up to 10, 20 centimetres away. So you can get these huge skip lesions along with, and I'll talk about it later, the lung nodules that are often associated with adenoid cystic. My general opinion about adenoid cystic is nobody really cured, even if you chop out the adenoid cystic 15, 20 years later, they almost always come back with normal um, mets. Um, you can change your V3 when you're looking on your sections all the way back up, basically going to the skull base or where it comes out of frame novale, and you can even chase it up, like I say, to the cavernous sinus and the quiet canal and all the way back there. And then if there's involvement of the cavernous sinus, you can knock off the other branch of the V3 because that's where they sit on the um, medial wall of where that lies. So the V3 will track up and it can track up to the drive, um, general ganglion and actually the base overall there. Now, if you look on the image on the left, um, the red marker here basically shows you uh, the semilunar ganglion and you can see how it is semilunar in shape and it looks almost chrysenteric. And then you can see on this side where the entire nerve A itself is thickened. And then actually when you come to the ganglion, the ganglion really doesn't look like a crescentic moon in any way, shape or form. The other thing for the ENT surgeon, so one is the aspect of lumps and bumps that go there. The other aspect is the inflammatory and effective processes that can happen. Always think of masticator space, the association with trismus and the involvement of poor dentition. It is massively, massively, massively underreported. And this is an acute phase is almost always autogenic in origin. Yeah. And just be aware of the molars tipping back and do have a high index of suspicion of not agreeing with the report in regards to these types of things and use your clinical index of suspicion of what the problem is. Yeah. If not sure, involve Max Fax telling colleagues. Yeah, the majority of the time they're very, very helpful in these types of cases. So here's a collection in the ma masticated space, otogenic where you're basically your molars have actually split backwards and then kind of screen pus back. And then you can see here what's happening in the parapharyngeal space it's getting pushed backwards and medially over here. And you can see that, and that's because of where it's arising from the masticated space across. And that kind of dictates the stuff that we were talking about a second ago. So here's some tumors of the um, masticated space. So we'll talk about rhabdomyosarcomas or chondrosarcomas. And in effect, these all do the same thing because of where they're coming from too. And what is different when you look at them is that actually the, um, don't tend to think these use Hansfield units, because I think Hounsfield unit is a CT definition, not an MI definition, but the equivalent of a Hounsfield unit, so the intensity of if something is uh, either hypoechogenic, I said the word right, hypoechogenic, thank you very much, <laughs> versus hyper, and that's what you should technically be using when you're looking at these, and obviously the cartilage just lights up like a Christmas tree. Right, space. So, so We've already spoken about this overall. So superficial to deep cervical fascia, there's some really important things which are really, really useful in regards to this, and it's your relation to the retromandibular vein that I'm going to talk about. So your parotid fascia basically contains the parotid band itself, both superficial deep, and part of the tail, and the tail often leads on to the back of the neck, and sometimes it's difficult to attenuate 
when you're doing neck dissections, the back of the parotids, like people go into them without no real significant issues as long as you only take the tail. Um, there's some parotid nodes, and there can be up to 60 nodes inside the parotid gland itself, and the retromandibular vein that I've mentioned, and on the deep apps aspect, the UCA, and then the elongation of the stylohyoid um, ligament, which we'll talk about for access to the deep aspect of the um, parotid gland and the parapharyngeal space. So here you can see it going up at the skull base and you can see where it sits and you can see the relation to the carotid and also the masticator space that we've already spoken about. Now, if you've got a mass coming from the deep aspect of the parotid, these often will push forwards. And you can see here's carotid is getting pushed that way. And you can see which way your peripheral and your path is going. I did mention retromandibular vein, so a really good marker for um, radiologically in regards to where the facial nerve is and whether something lies in the deep versus the superficial part of the gland. We know as surgeons that 80% of the gland is superficial to that, roughly, about 20% is deep. The retromandibular vein almost always, not always, but almost always, is behind the nerve. Yeah. So if your mass looks like it's behind the retromandibular vein, it's definitely in the deep part. If it's superficial to it, it's always, always anterior to the nerve. Now, the thing you need to be aware of is the issue with parotid tumors is that you get this bosselation in some types of boss, um, tumors. So you might have a bit which starts in the superficial, but actually then slowly over many years expands, expands, expands. And as it expands, it, it makes this almost hourglass appearance where it, it doesn't get stretched where the nerve is because it doesn't have as much skin. So they tend to cut, sometimes kind of go out, then in, and then out. And that's almost pathognomonic majority of the time with pleomorphic slide around nodes. So here you can see a kind of PSA, which um, is kind of pushing that all forwards and medially overall. And this is a long term one. So this one looks very bosselated. And here you can see the narrowing of where it's not expanded. Um, so but I process pathology, which can give you kind of enlarged products that you need to think about is inflammatory conditions, which could include Dr. Calfly inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. Schroger syndrome is uh, notorious for this, of giving you diffuse clostridium enlargement. However, Sjogren's can also do the opposite, and it can actually cause you to have uh, what's called ex extra the cysts inside them, where you get these large cysts that can occur overall. And just be aware that they sometimes look a bit kind of um, a bit um, suspicious, potentially. And sometimes they can be overdiagnosed as a consequence, but just be really careful to, if you get a product thing, to ask people if they have an inflammatory or a uh, rheumatoid type condition, including Schrodinger's. Um, always be wary of bilateral prosthesis. Yeah, bilateral, this is often a question in the FRCS, and it's often an exit question um, for the FRCS, which is the occurrence of bilateral multiple cysts in the prosthesis. And this is, an, is a common association or it used to, in particular, the 80s, 90s, and the noughties of HIV. And if you do see it, do raise it. And I, um, yeah, and I and you just need to do a HIV test with a CD4 count, basically, and an FBC on it. And, you know, a number of times that these come up in MDT, and then you do the HIV test and positive, it's really quite surprising. Um, these tend to regress to a certain extent once people are on antiretrovirals. Sometimes they regress almost completely, but often they shrink in size. Um, but if you see somebody who's HIV positive and they've got loads of lumps, just make sure that you look through their previous imaging because they probably had an image and it's probably there and probably nobody's actually spotted it. And so if you ever do get these, just, you know, make sure you do HIV test and just make sure you look at their old image. Because if it's been there for 10 years, you know, there's probably nothing to worry about in any way, shape or form. Right, tumors, and this is a, a T2A uh, image. So we're going to talk about the PSAs that I was kind of alluding to. And you can see an image here. And you're starting to get that bosselation around the nerve, which is almost pathognomonic. Unfortunately, the image I could I couldn't find a really good bosselated tumor image, and so I've ended up just showing you a circle. But we'll get you a better bosselated image in a second. Um, in adults, 80% of the parotids are benign, and uh, like I said, think about the retromandibular vein in regards to the relations. And then this is what happens when you throw them on their MRI scan. If you get these big bosselations and they'll, they'll push everything forwards and kind of upwards. So they'll go anteromedially and they should be bright on the T2 and the parapharyngeal fat, as we've discussed. So other parotid tumors to think about are adenolymphomas, aka Warthians, if you like to talk about uh, names for people who are dead. 
um, you know, walk-ins is obviously a very old-fashioned term for it, but the adeno lymphomas, they also used to be known years and years ago. So uh, if you ever thought about why is a PSA called a PSA, a pleomorphic cyri adenoma, well, the old, old term for walkians was a monocytic uh, problem. So you used to have a pleomorphic and a monomorphic. And the monomorphic used to be the old, old term prior to adenolymphoma, prior to warthians, and it used to be. And that's why you, the other group is still called pleomorphic slug adenomas, which is just a, a very bizarre bit of nomenclature that's just never changed and still confers to something from 60 plus years ago. Um, so with adenolymphomas, aka warthians, 20 can be multicentric, 20% can be bilateral. They are pests because you can get these people who turn up and see you and they've got these massive big lumps they've had for years and often they're associated with smokers slightly more common in males and then suddenly they're like oh it just started hurting one day and then it's now shrunk and it's almost gone and they can auto infarct and the auto infarct can happen in up to 10 to even 20 percent of these and when they auto infarct they can be really quite variable because they can bleed into them and so then you can end up with false positives of then them being scanned at that point in time and then they look a bit gnarly as a consequence of the bleeding into them. The other thing is sometimes an auto infarct will also be set off by FNA in them. So very occasionally you can FNA in them and then two weeks later they get an auto infarct. And so just be aware that if you do see that, that's often um, very suggestive of these types of things. And just leave them alone is what I'd say. But the other caveat about product tumors is don't always believe your uh, needle test is 10% of the time it's wrong. So really important that you know that. So. Uh, uh, cytology is notoriously difficult because if you look at the World Health Organization classification of property tumors, I think there's about 20 different types of product tumors or 28, I think, in the current classification. The other two that I want to mention from pride point of view are mucopodermoids, and these often have these kind of finger like tendrils that they kind of push out and if they arise from mucous glands. The adenoid cystic that I've already spoken about in the master, uh, master cater space are the ones which are highly prone for uh, perineal tumoral spread and running up and down nerves. Other things you get are kind of mixed tumors, other bizarre tumors. Um, you can have snooks and all sorts of things, lymphomas and kind of skin mets. Primarily, it's it's the top four are the PSAs, the Warthians, the mucopodermoids, your adenoid cystics, and the other big group you should be thinking about is skin metastases, especially in the Caucasian population in the UK, making sure you look for those. I'm going to try and squeeze it all down in my next five minutes for the 13 slides. Let's do the correct space. So unfortunately, once I get going, I get going. The uh, carotid space is kind of the last real zone that we're going to talk about. And the carotid space, is, as uh, Shadi already said, uh, contains the ICA, IJV, the lower four cranial nerves, 9, 10, 11, 12, coming out of the jugular frame into the first three and a half possible from the last one, respectively, and the IJV nodes, the IJV complex as a whole. And there's obviously the sympathetic chain, which sits sort of very close proximity. We're not going to talk much about eagles, but the reason I've thrown an eagles picture here is that um, it's a really good way of splitting up um, your spaces. So if you actually think about that space, there's the pre styloid space and the post styloid space. So everything we've been talking about in the pre styloid fact. So when you look at the paraphrangeal space, you put the styloid in the middle. Well, everything in front is that paraphrangeal fat that we're talking about. That's where it lives. Yeah. So you have some branches like the IMA, the ascending pharyngeal up there. And you get the V3 branch from the tensor palatini where it connects up from the master space and it comes down and across. And then occasionally you get some salivary tissue up there. Your post styloid space is the bit that contains all the gubbins and all the workings. So they're your low cranial nerves, the ICA, the IJB, and the sympathetic trunk and the nodes overall. So when you split up the clockworks at the back, yeah. And so don't get confused when they talk about pre and post styloid space versus a parapharyngeal space or the retro styloid space and sometimes people use this interchangeably so your carotid masses basically they'll push your parapharyngeal space because they're from the post posterior aspect i.e behind the styloid and they'll lift up your pre-styloid space and therefore they'll lift up that parapharyngeal fat they all click now and it will lift up that parapharyngeal fat forwards yeah and that's what they do and so any abnormality primarily of big blood vessels yeah big nerves will give you these types of problems overall. Yeah. So kind of aneurysms, pseudoaneurysms, carotid dissections, paraganglionous thrombosis. Last few slides, 
So here's a paraphrangeal collection that we were alluding to earlier when we talk about paratons for abscess, and you can see exactly what it does to fat. So what you do is you get this fat stranding, you get this ring enhancement of the contrast, then you get this pushing of the, of the paraphrangeal fat upwards and inwards overall. So the carotid body tumors um, links up very well to the rest of the glomuses, and um, the salt and pepper voids that we've already spoken about, I think it was Ahmed who was talking about them, where there's high intensity versus low intensity, and it's where you've got thrombus versus where you've got bits where it's bled out. Um, and the classic thing is what's called a Elias sign. That is the musical instrument in the bottom right hand side. And on an angiogram, this is often how they classically look. So they classically have this kind of mixed heterogeneous appearance. You've got these kind of little voids and all sorts of cluster. And the lyre is as the carotid itself splays and comes back around the tumour. Globus uh, vagales again just mentioned, and these can go all the way to the skull base. So think about these going through and potentially the IJV um, all the way up to the skull base, and it pushes the uh, the paraphrangeal space uh, posterior to anterior, and it may touch through to there, but it doesn't tend to go through the jugular foramen. Whereas your glomus jugularis, they are the ones that can kind of go up in more easily through the jugular foramen. Um, I don't know why I put Val schwannoma, but uh, vagal schwannoma. Um, these are kind of fused form masses, so no flow voids, and they can get cysts, which make them very confusing when you look at them on the MRI scan. And again, this does the same thing with a paraphrangeal fat and pushes in the same direction. Just very quickly, you just mentioned the danger space in the uh, alar fascia. Obviously, this tracks all the way down to your mediastinum, whether it's at T2 or T12, depending on which one you're in. And these kind of places to be aware. You have your nodes at the suprahyoid neck, not the infrahyoid neck. And they're classically known as node ruvia, and they're the ones that tend to separate. And this is that area there. And this tends to lift up your paraphrangeal fat and bring it all up. And this would be a kind of fluid collection, which is um, a malignant collection. And these are your nodes, and you can see what it does. So to summarize, it's all about the fat, you know, what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. So when you're looking at these things in relation to these, the simplest way of thinking about them is what do they do to that pre-styloid, that paraphrangeal fat space? Yeah. Do they push it posterior laterally? Do they push it anteriorly? Do they push it medially? Do they push it a combination? And these kind of things to think about overall. I hope that was a useful half an hour whistle stop of um, some head and neck radiology. If you've got any questions, please feel free to ask. Keep on no, no, no. Amazing presentation, to be honest. Uh, I wish not to stop you, but uh, unfortunately, we're still uh, a bit late. Um, so just so that. Really, I'm I'm lucky that uh, I have invited uh, amazing uh, faculty from everywhere. Um, thanks for everyone who uh, attend as well. Uh, I think so there is a question for somebody. Do you want to ask some questions? I think so there is uh, one already in the in the comments. Uh, is that okay? Uh, I think since somebody have raised up his hand, can you just put it down to and you can write down your comment and we can uh, uh, answer the question. I think so the first question uh, was, uh, let me check it. Could you do FMB? So FMB for the parotid tumors? Yeah, yeah, we, we do. Uh, we're pro. I suspect um, Amy Barnes for sure. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I'm very good at names, and I think it's pretty powerful. The thing about um, them being in false index of diagnosis, Um, 
say thirty percent. Not sure. Okay, the other question was uh, first, the first choice would you uh, be the FNSC for inconclusive or suspicious lymphoma? A core biopsy would be given more definite answer. Oh, the process core biopsy and lymphoma question. So the, the answer is the index of suspicion. If you think this is lymphoma, and it depends on which bit of the gland is it diffuse enlarge of the gland? Because the diffuse enlarge of the gland, the tail would be enlarge. The tail is more compared to the skull for a full that fellow. Yeah. Ask the ask yeah, maybe advance the person who's actually yeah. for this. Based for them such thing. They're not diagnostic, but also don't forget. What proportion of cases only has a question of this? Those fully, even locally, so they may have proxy margins, they'll often have no one on the system, but it's not difficult. Something different about it, so much easier in the blood mix, it is to get a four. And so, but your answer is yes. This, this sounds, I don't know why, but it should work. It should work. So oh, far away, but they say the sound there, not clear. So, but uh, yeah, but the mic is working. It should work there. So it's, if it's blue, that means it's still connected and it's connected as well. OK, can you come? Uh, um, I think this is enough for questions because we are a bit late. Sorry for this. Um, so next will be uh, Mr. Muhammad Al Fiqi, uh, she is a, a consultant head and neck uh, in Norwich University Hospital. Is that, is that correct? Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's Norfolk and Norwich University. Hospital. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, so you're going to talk more uh, about the ultrasound in, related to NT, and we're going to get, get the clinical parts from any here on the ground. We wish that you were with us today, but and everyone to uh, to be there as well for the hands on. But uh, uh, I'll leave this for you. You can present it and share from your side as well. Yeah, let me just, uh, I'll try to share it from the PowerPoint, so uh, from the um, Teams itself. So uh... yeah, just yeah, it's there. Amazing. Yeah. I can't yeah. see it yet. So oh, here it is. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I'll just talk from the uh, surgeon perspective. Uh, I'm not a radiologist, and um, most of us, as as ET surgeons, we 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 like the uh, cross-sectional imaging. Um, can you see my presentation? Or you you muted, uh, Abraham? Can can you see me? Okay. Yeah, we can okay, see you, and brilliant. we can hear you as well. Don't worry. Yeah, just... cool. Um, yeah, so. Uh, uh, as I said, we 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 love we we like the cross-sectional imaging, CTs, MRI, PET scans because we can read them easily. But when it comes to ultrasound, um, personally, when I was a trainee, I just used to uh, read the report and had no interest in the images. But gradually, when you start attending uh, MDTs and you see the radiologist presenting the the images and you start understand more about it. Um, and if you have interest in, in thyroid surgery, then you really need to uh, know about the ultrasound scan. Um, so um, just a few basics. Uh, ultrasound means sound, ultrasound uses sound waves above what the uh, human can hear. We normally hear, I think, up to 20,000 um, hertz uh, ultrasound uh, scan machines to use. Um, something above two um, megahertz, which is like two million hertz and above. Um, and the the, ba the the science behind it is there is an electric current, so you plug the machine into a uh, electricity, and then and the machine will will change the the electricity into sound waves, and um, this will be. Um, can you? lost my presentation can you um yeah read something? yes yeah, yes you, you, we we lost the presentation if you can share it again okay. i think you, you need to stop sharing your screen because uh i'm i'm, I'm stopping I'm, I'm not uh, sharing my screen so okay 
let's just uh... yes it's now there thank you we can okay so just need to We're just having a thunderstorm here, so connection is a little bit slow, so apologies in advance. Um, so yeah, so sound waves will uh, will travel through the uh, tissues and depending on the density of the tissues, uh, uh, some some waves will be reflected back to the um, reflected back to the uh, machine and some will be absorbed and just continue passing through the human tissues. And this will create the different uh, grades and different colors that we can see on the ultrasound scan between black and very, very bright. So, uh, and this is can explain what happens when when the sound waves uh, travel through tissues. So fluid will 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 most of the most of the um, waves will go through the fluid and very, very little will be reflected back to the uh, probe. And that's why um, if if you are scanning a uh, structure that have a lot of fluid, it will look very dark. On the other hand, if you see on the right hand side, if you are scanning a bony structure such as a stone or, or a bone, it will be very bright. And then behind this, because because most of the waves are reflected back, then there is very little will pass through the structures deeper to this. So everything deeper to, to this will look very, very dark. Um, and this is called acoustic shadow. And, 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 and depending on the tissue density between these very dark and very white, you'll have different um, um, grades. Uh, another, the same same um, 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 image here, where you can see uh, 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 on the left hand side below here, uh, there's a, a structure filled with with fluid, and it looks very very dark. Uh, on the I, 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 I can just tell me how we can uh, just um, uh, do the next because uh, I think so. There is a problem in things arising here. Stuff like that. Uh, yeah, you, you cannot see my presentation or. No, 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 it's done now. OK, there was like a problem in the synchronization. That's fine. You can OK, you can do it. All right. So on the right hand side, uh, you, you can see there's a bone here and it looks very bright and you cannot see anything deeper to that. And in between these, you will have um, different grades depending on the uh, density. So you can have an isoechoic uh, tissue or hypoechoic or hyperechoic depends on the density of the um, tissues. Right, can you see as a full screen now? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, that's fine. You can just continue now. Okay. That's great. Right, so uh, now we'll just uh, uh, have some descriptive terms, which is uh, slightly different from CT and MRI scan. So when when you read that there is a structure that is anechoic, that means that there is no echo returns to the um, uh, transducer, and and this is is very likely a cystic uh, structure. Uh, when um, um, there is a hypoechoic uh, uh, term in in the report, that means that the, there is a very strong reflection of the. Um, uh, sorry, uh, the hyperechoic means that there is a very strong reflection of the sound waves back to the transducer, and then this uh, structure or this tissue will be uh, bright. And you can see this, as we said, with bone or, or some, some sort of classification. Uh, hypoechoic, that means that tissues that can, um, uh, would produce weak echoes, uh, and that means that uh, most of the sound waves can uh, pass through these tissues. Some uh, other terms is when you read uh, homogeneous tissue, that means that the uh, acoustic impedance of this tissue is similar or this organ is similar. So on the ultrasound scan, this will have a uniform appearance uh, um, on the screen. Uh, on the other hand, when you read a that when there is a heterogeneous tissue, that means that there would be um, uh, multiple structures inside this organ and each structure will have a slightly different uh, acoustic impedance and this can give you a, a varying um, degree of brightness on uh, the screen. 
Also, there are mainly two two modes that we use in, in the head and neck. B mode, which is the, the brightness mode between um, black and white. And uh, this is uh, results from uh, interrupted uh, sound waves or uh, the Doppler mode where we use it to assess the vascularity. And this is usually a continuous um, uh, emission of sound waves. So um, in, in my opinion, the most important use of ultrasound scan is assessing the thyroid gland. Um, if you see a, a thyroid nodule on a CT scan or MRI or even a PET scan, you will still go back to a, a, an ultrasound and do ultrasound and that can tell you if this is a benign nodule that you can ignore it or this is some uh, something suspicious or cancerous that you need to uh, biopsy. And this is because the thyroid gland is very superficial uh, gland, yeah, um, so you can easily scan it, you can get a very um, nice images on the ultrasound when from for for the for the ultrasound, unlike something like a deep lobe of protein, which you can hardly see on um, on an ultrasound scan. Um, uh, you still can see my presentation, or it's gone, but it's back now. That's fine. I, I, I will I will do it for you. Just say next and I will do it for you. Don't worry. OK, okay so uh, are you are you sharing your screen now or? Yes, yeah, yeah. OK, so we are the strict in number six, the descriptive okay. uh, terms. Yeah, so if you go to uh, so it, please. Yeah. Are you in seven now? Yes, 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 Muhammad. Yeah, you can just continue and just say okay. next to what we would do. Right. So, and um, the the nice thing about the, the ultrasound scan, it, it, it can you can easily uh, do a assessment for malignancy, and, and you can stratify the patient and say this is benign, this is indeterminate nodule, or this is cancerous nodule. Um, also, when you, you scan the thyroid, you, you scan the lymph nodes as well of the neck, and um, and you can easily find out if these, there's any metastatic um, uh, nodes in the neck. Um, another important feature of ultrasound is can tell you the size of the nodule. And now we are heading towards less than total thyroidectomy. So if 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 there's a patient with a classic papillary thyroid cancer, uh, um, small two three centimeter, then there's a, you can do a hemothyroidectomy for these, and there is now a, a national trial in the UK where we're comparing the hemothyroid um, um, with total thyroid uh, for for these uh, cohort of of cancers. Um, an ultrasound can 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 give you a, a, an accurate estimation of the size of this nodule. Also, you can do biopsies for. Um, um, thyroid nodules easily with guided by ultrasound and this significantly increased the accuracy compared to if you just try to do it without uh, ultrasound guidance. Um, it it helps you as well to know if there's a, a large parameter loop and the extent of that loop so you can plan your um, um, incision. Uh, sometimes, if, especially if you're doing um, thyroid cancer surgery, you have to chase that loop up and remove all of it. So you might need you may think putting your incision slightly high up. Um, also, uh, ectopic thyroid tissue, you can identify this when you are doing um, um, ultrasound scan. Uh, next, please. Uh, then, so ultrasound scan report will have uh, three main parts. Um, it will, there is, it should be a comment on the um, uh, gland itself generally. Uh, so uh, you should tell from the uh, a report if the gland is uh, homogeneous or there's some heterogeneity. Uh, you can tell if the gland is atrophic or enlarged. Um, it also can tell you about the echogenicity of the gland. Um, so if there is a, a hypoechoic gland or, or the gland is hyperechoic, also you can, uh, can tell you about the vascularity of the gland itself. Also, you can see uh, calcifications. Um, also, the 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 uh, report will tell you if there is any retrosternal extension, and this is where you need to do some cross-sectional imaging to assess this extension. If there is any tracheal deviation, that may affect the intubation uh, as well. Then, um, 
there should be a section in the report that commenting on any uh, nodules. So you uh, should tell you the number of them. Uh, yeah, if they are numerous, then th that's fine. But if there's a handful of, uh, of, of, of nodules, then there should be the number for these and their location, which loop and the size of each of them. Um, also the ecogenicity, which is extremely important and vascularity of each nodule, uh, their shape. Um, and if there's any calcification inside them, and if there's any extra thyroid spread, then there should be a comment on the uh, any uh, lymph nodes, their size, location, shape, if there is any calcification, their vascularity, vascularity and if there's any um, extra thyroid, uh, ext uh, extra nodal extension of these nodes. Uh, um, Hamad, sorry again, the, which, which slide is it? Because I think so we, there is a... We, we go into slide nine. Nine again. Okay, so nine. Okay. Well, you can see the um, different U grades. Uh, can you see that on your slide as well? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I okay. have to do it from my side as well. So. Okay. Right. So, um, so here in the UK, we have a a, a, a classification for thyroid nodules because, uh, as you know. Thyroid nodules are, are very common uh, and most of these are benign. Uh, so we need to have some sort of classification that can tell you this is a benign nodule, which you can sort of ignore if it is asymptomatic or uh, this is some sort of suspicious or very likely cancerous nodule where you need to do a needle biopsy. So uh, we have five um, 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 it's, it's called U classification. So from U1 to U5, U1 is considered is, is a normal thyroid gland where there's no nodules at all. Um, a U2 is a uh, uh, benign nodule. Uh, U3 is considered indeterminate nodule. So um, and U4 is suspicious, and U5 is very suspicious and very likely a malignant. Um, uh, nodule. So uh, I'll talk about each of them uh, in a bit more detail. So if you go to next slide, please. So uh, this is a normal thyroid gland, um, which is, uh, as I said, it is usually uh, homogeneous and is usually slightly brighter than the muscle. So as you can see here, I don't know if you can see my 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 mouse at all or it's not. Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, again, there's something wrong, but it's, uh, I'm gonna push synchronize and try your. Can you set down? Is it? Yeah, I'll just try to. Uh... Is it? Can you see it now? Or no? Unfortunately, uh, no. Uh, you know, this technical things is. Probably one of us has an older version of the. Uh... Teams. Uh, yeah. We'll just try again to share window and see if that works. So, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. But can you put your comfort there or the indicator? Yeah, can you see this moving? Is that about lucky? Yeah, what about now? Can you see something moving on the screen or? No. I think it's this live synchronization, so. Uh... Yeah, Uh, I don't know, can you see my screen now or still? You're muted, Abdurrahman, I can't hear you. Uh, you, are, you are muted, I think. I... Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, well, I'm saying just okay. push the pin and then. You... Okay, so we are on uh, this slide where you have an normal thyroid gland yes, and you can yes, see sure. it is, yeah. So you can see that the thyroid is, is brighter than the strap muscles. 
So it's slight, it's called high isochroic and the strap is slightly darker than the uh, thyroid and this is an important uh, um, um, sign. Uh, and there's Martin, no... if, you just, if you push the pin down there, there is a pin like uh, and two R's and pin, just push the pin and you can get your uh, prompt and you can see it. the indicator yeah. will be there. So, um, can you see this now? Over this. Just to show us, you know, with the pen. Uh, oh yeah, you mean to use the pen? Yes, so you can use the pen or the indicator. Says, yeah, can you see the pen moving or? 